You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Well, it's always nice to begin a new study. I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's a new beginning, it's a fresh start, it's perhaps a person we don't often focus on, gee, who is sort of uh, one of those kings that we sort of tend to gloss over in the chronology of the kings, but um, I, I'm not quite sure why I actually even chose the subject. <laughs> and I think it's because somehow I have a compulsion for stories that have sad endings. Um, if you remember my last study was on, on Abiathar, and a, again, Abiathar was uh, a young priest who became a high priest, who offsided with David, gave him a lot of comfort throughout the wilderness, and was a very steadfast friend for a long, long time. But in the end, Abiathar defected, and that was a very sad ending. And, well, tonight, it's another character with a sad ending. But maybe that's a bit like life, of course. And I think there is a very powerful lesson that is threaded through the life of Jehu, and the lesson is that we can't plateau in the truth. We have to not only maintain our energy and our enthusiasm, we have to grow in a very practical way in our, in our qualities and our attributes to be more like God. And again, you know, spiritual maturity is all about growing and developing. So we're taking this little example here and we're analysing Jehu, his life, uh, and sadly, of course, there was, there was a fade off toward the end and perhaps we have to be prepared uh, and perhaps analyse our own selves to make sure that we're maintaining growth and spiritual development as far as God is concerned. So as a young man, he began very, very well and as we say, he faded off toward the end. So it's all about choices, it's all about consequences and on the backdrop, of course, of our special weekend that we had with Brother Jamie on lot, those choices are really, really critical. Uh, not only when we're younger in the truth, but as we go uh, and advance through truth, we still have choices that we have to make and there are consequences. And for Jehu, uh, toward the end, as we say, some bad choices were made. So we want to have a look over the next um, five sessions, really, the life of Jehu. Our first session tonight is on selection. We're going to have a look at how he was anointed. He was selected by Elisha for a particular task. He was given the authority of Yahweh. This prophet came from God with a special message for him. So it wasn't as though he was just um, um, invading the chronology of the kings on his own background. He was selected particularly by um, this young man who was a representative of Elisha for a particular task. In our second session, a little bit further on, we're going to have a look at the seriousness of Jehu. Uh, he had a task to do and he fully committed to that. He eradicated as much as he could the evil from the northern territory of those tribes. In our, in our third session, we're going to have a look at the strategy that he employed. Obviously, it wasn't just going in there and hoping everything was OK. There's a certain pathway that he took. Um, there's, in our fourth session, some separation as far as the truth was concerned. And then in our fifth session, as we say, you know, a little bit of a bad ending. Uh, there's a shortfall, there's a fade off toward the end. So again, the exhortation comes back to us. For many of us, we may have only been the truth two, three, four years, five years, 10, 20. Have we got that same enthusiasm, that energy, that love, that development, that growth? That's really, really important, of course, for, for our progression. So tonight, we're gonna to have a look at this selection and his anointing to be king over Israel, and we'll just explore a little bit of his character. So we've got uh, three aims that we want to um, follow through on the course of this particular series. And the first one is to be inspired by the energy and enthusiasm of Jehu. And of course, that's always an incentive for us. We tend to live in an age where everything's very moderate and uh, we're very casual with everything and we can become that in our relationship with God. So this was a man who had great energy and enthusiasm. And again, we need to be able to lean upon that example. Um, secondly, to be unwavering and decisive with a strong spiritual fortitude to help work through the tough issues that we might face. So again, you know, it wasn't easy for Jehu. I mean, he was up against the backdrop of Jezebel and all the environment that she created. So it wasn't as though he was just gonna to walk to the throne and sit on it. He really had to push that and progress that. And he was very decisive in the, in the pathway that he took. And again, you know, when we, we are challenged by certain issues in life, are we decisive? Do we take the godly path? 
or do we weigh up on a lot of variations and then sort of make a detour? And our third little uh, lesson we want to take is to maintain a consistent positive growth in our devotion to God by being optimistic and helping others to grow by our example. So again, you know, these, there are some great positive examples in the Bible and perhaps we lean upon people that are very positive that we find are substantial in the truth and consistent in the truth, they're people that we're attracted to. Well, we, may be, we need to become that sort of person as well. We can't always just be fluctuating around and relying on others to give us support. We've got to grow into solid pillars of strength in the truth. So they're the aims that we want to accomplish through our series. Well, our background to Jehu doesn't actually begin in verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 9. We actually have to wind back 12 years to where our story actually begins. So I want you to come back to 1 Kings chapter 19. It's back a few pages, I guess. Uh, and this is where the story of Jehu begins, actually back in the time of Elijah. So chronologically, and I'll show a bit of chronology in a minute, but we're actually winding back 12 years. And it's insightful for us because it shows that God works behind the scenes in our own lives, often a long, long period before a particular issue surfaces. And this is very much the case here. So 1 Kings chapter 19 is obviously about Elijah. And Elijah has just had his performance up on Mount Carmel. He, he was hoping for an amazing success. He was hoping for the whole nation of Israel to transition into worshippers of God. And that was a failure. And we know that Elijah was particularly depressed. He went all the way down to, to Horeb. Uh, and there, of course, he had this little incident that showed him with a still small voice that it wasn't so much as a big fanfare of energy. Sometimes it was consistent and quiet words that encouraged people to make changes. But at the end of that whole scenario, there's a little commission that Elijah was given. And so we just come across there to uh, verse 16, or oh, verse 15 really. It says, uh, Yahweh said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you come, anoint Hazael to be king over... There's three things he has to do. Anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Secondly, here's our little uh, connecting point. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Melholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Then he goes on, it shall come to pass that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will slay, and he that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Now, what's the point of all that? Well, the interesting uh, fact of all that is that Elijah didn't do that. He was given a commission. There were three tasks very clearly here to anoint three different people and Elijah didn't do that. In fact, he only did one of those tasks and that was the anointing of Elisha. And there's a particular point. We might think, well, wonder why he didn't do that. Um, those three tasks, those three anointings. Why didn't Elijah fulfil his commission? Well, when we have a look at who these people are, um, obviously there, Hazael was a foreign king. He's right up in Syria. He's in Damascus. And he was going to execute a, a sword of justice upon the nation of Israel. Uh, secondly, there was a new king, Jehu, who was going to be in destruction on Israel. And thirdly, there was going to be a prophet Elisha, who would bring renewal to Israel. Now, interestingly, Elijah only commissioned Elisha. He only did that third part. And I wonder if the backdrop to that particular story was Elijah was starting to learn the lesson of the still small voice, that it wasn't all about destruction. Destruction doesn't always convert people. And so he was hesitant to um, anoint those other two individuals. Instead, he just anointed Elisha because he, he recognised the need for renewal. And a little bit, little bit later on, we'll find out, of course, that Elisha took on board these other two anointings. So that's interesting because this is our beginning start to the life of Jehu, and he's mentioned here. Now, this particular point is 12 years before Jehu actually was anointed. So when we have a look at chronology, and you might have this little chart in your Bible, well, this was, of course, before Ahab died. All right, so here's, here's the reign of Ahab here. We've got his son, well, his grandson. There's two sons here. Uh, Joram reigned a little bit longer, of course. But here's Jehu here. He doesn't begin until around about 12 years after chronologically this initiation. 
So again, it's sort of a, a very interesting aspect to how God works behind the scenes in our lives. Sometimes, you know, a situation happens and we expect God to be working at it. We may not realise that God actually began that whole process a decade before, putting people in particular positions to help support us or, or give us direction in life. So there's a 12-year gap uh, between the starting point of our story and perhaps the, the main narrative back there in 2 Kings uh, chapter 9. So here's a little bit of background as well, just to paint the picture a little bit more. Here's the chronology, well this is the chronology of course of the southern territory, uh, Judah and Benjamin, and up here is the northern territory, this is what we're dealing with. Here's Jehu here, of course uh, Ahab and Jezebel there in the time of Elijah, and then Jehoram began to reign, Ahaziah married, well, well that was the, the um, the daughter of Jezebel married Jehoram over here, so there was sort of a family connection there as well. Ahaziah didn't last very long, it was only a year, and then Jehoram began his reign, and this is the one that uh, Jehu took out. So here's uh, Jehu here, he begins in 841 BC, and he begins a long dynasty, a long genealogy of at least four sons and grandsons and great-grandsons, around about 88, 90 years of the history of Israel, so this is a particular change in the dynasty here, um, as was prophesied by Elijah, the removal of the Ahab-Jezebel uh, co coordination there. Jehu in one day took out two kings. I mean, this is our next session. Um, quite amazing, his energy and enthusiasm. He didn't dilly-dally around. Two kings just straight away in one day, one swift moment, were taken off the board. So quite an incredible beginning to the reign of Jehu and of course he executed that quite thoroughly. So as far as Jehu is concerned, uh, interesting little background and we're coming back to 2 Kings chapter 9. We've um, already found out that the background is 12 years earlier. God was already aware of this young man. So it would seem when we work out the chronology that Jehu was around about perhaps early 20s when God gave that commission to Elijah to go and anoint him. And I always think that's interesting as a point of observation that you know, God doesn't necessarily wait till we're mature, till we're 40 or 50 or 60. Sometimes, like in the life of David, God is very aware of where our heart is and where, where our love and our devotion is. So he's already seen in Jehu in his early 20s, that he has a love for the things of God in a very bad environment. And Jehu had no hesitation in taking out the originators of that bad environment, which of course was the descendants of Ahab and Jezebel. So right in his early 20s, he's got a love for God. God recognises that. And there's a little bit of forward planning on the part of, the, of God that one day he would be selected to execute judgment upon the house of Ahab. So, you know, early 20s, so another 12, 12 years go, goes by, he's around about possibly mid-30s now, here back in 2 Kings chapter 9 when he's anointed. So that just gives us a bit of a, a background um, so we can evaluate his, his age. So coming back to 2 Kings chapter 9, as, a little, as we've said, that was the background. 12 years has passed by. Now in 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 1, Elisha gives his commission and it says, uh, he called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, gird up your loins. So there's this sense of urgency in that phrase, isn't it? It's like gird up your loins, get ready to go. There's, there's an urgent thing you've got to do. We sort of say, well, wonder why that was. I mean, 12 years have gone by. It's not as though it was something that he had to do in a hurry, was it? Well, actually it was because if you look at the previous verse, chapter 8 and verse 29, the two kings have come together. So chapter 8 and verse 29 it says, King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which he'd had just in battle there uh, when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. And, and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram because, uh, um, because the son of Ahab in Jezreel was sick as well. So here's the two kings. They've come together. They're um, confederating together. And um, this is the moment, of course, that Elisha suggested to this young man, take action now, gird up your loins and go. 
So the armies were encamped at Ramoth Gilead and Jehu was out there, he's captain of the army. He was defending Ramoth Gilead against the enemy. But meanwhile, the two kings were sort of idling away there in Jezreel. And this was a moment, 12 years had gone by, um, Elisha now initiates this young man to go and begin this whole process. So he's commanded to go and anoint him. So verse 3 says, take this box of oil, pour it on her head and give this commission that Yahweh uh, has authorised him to be the king of the northern tribes and to take action against the house of Ahab. So what's interesting is that Jehu is the only king, he's the only king to ever be anointed in those northern territories. So of course we know, you know, the kings of, of Judah were generally reasonably faithful there was never really a, a good king at all up in the northern territories at all. Th he's the only one that was ever anointed. So, of course, what kings had been anointed? Well, obviously, Saul had been anointed by Samuel. David was anointed by Samuel, um, obviously to mark the authority of God on this young person, David, as he prepared to take the, the throne. Solomon was anointed by the high priest Zadok and Nathan as well. So... This whole anointing process is one that gives the authority of God to a particular person. And Jehu was the only one up in the north who ever was anointed. And that was reinforcing, I guess, for him because it, it gave him the authoritative approval from God or from the, the prophet, as it were, to move ahead with this particular commission. So he reigned for uh, around about 28 years, uh, Jehu did. Uh, he's the second longest reign, apart from Jeroboam, his great-grandson. And as we've said, his contemporaries were Queen Athaliah down in the south and then the young King Joash. You'll remember King Joash was protected. Athaliah destroyed all the seed royal down in Judah. Uh, she ascended, usurped the throne, as it were, ho horribly brutal person. Uh, so that was contemporary, really, with Jehu. It was Athaliah down there and then Joash. So he, um, as we've said, had four uh, dynasties that he put in place, so quite a substantial reign. Now, one of the interesting things about archaeology is that we have a record of Jehu. So, you know, again, this is a wonderful fact. The Bible isn't just full of made-up fairy tales of people that never existed, figments of someone's imagination documented in stone. And this is the black, os uh, black obelisk of Shalmaneser III. So it's quite important because it's the only portrayal we have in the ancient Near East uh, of an Israelite or a Judean monarch. Here, he is here. So he's in the Hebrew scriptures and here he is here. It's the earliest depiction of an Israelite. So when I was reading up on this particular article and here's the obelisk here and here I am in younger years there at the British Museum pointing it out in fact, I look as though I've got a, a print of the obelisk on my shirt. I don't even know why I'm wearing that obelisk, why, that, why I'm wearing that shirt. I'm lucky I wasn't arrested. I was going out for taking something from the museum. But anyway, here I am pointing to Jehu. Now, here he is here. Now, you notice all these are in their royal garments. And what they're saying here is here he's, he's been stripped of his royal garment. He's basically in his underwear um, as a, a, a point of embarrassment. And he's bowing before um, Shalmaneser III. So this is the Assyrian king. So there is some documented proof of Jehu. Obviously, we read about his enthusiasm and his energy. But of course, when it came to the superpower of Assyria, then he was sort of humbled uh, quite dramatically. Well, verse 1 talks about, just at the end of verse 1, there's this place, Ramoth Gilead. And again, it's mentioned in verse 4, go to Ramoth Gilead. Now, we might not know. We might just think, oh, well, that was probably, you know, around the corner from Bethlehem or something. So where is Ramoth Gilead? So the prophet Elisha was not in the land of Israel at this time, uh, and he gave commission to this young prophet to actually go down to Ramoth Gilead. So when we put a map up here, Ramoth Gilead or Damascus, this is where Elisha was. So 2 Kings 8 verse 7, just the previous chapter, say he was up there anointing Hazael. And as he's anointing that king, he says to a young prophet, go down and anoint Jehu because the time's come. So it all happened with, with great acceleration. 
If he's right, Elisha's right up here in this area. Uh, Ramoth Gilead is right over here. That was one of the um, tri uh, refuge, cities of refuge, six cities of refuge, three on either side of the Jordan River. So that was one of the cities of refuge. It was under the control or had been under the control of the Syrians. And now Jehu with his army had come and they'd taken control of that and they're just reinforcing it. And of course, across here is Jezreel where the two kings were. And they were just sort of recuperating across here. So he tells one of the sons of the prophets to go down here and to anoint Jehu. And of course, eventually Jehu's going to come across there to Jezreel to exterminate these um, two kings. So Ramoth Gilead was lost to the, the Syrians previously. Uh, first to Kings 22 and verse 3 talk about that. That was the battle where Ahab and Jehoshaphat in, went together and Ahab was mortally wounded and he died of those wounds. You might remember um, he was a bit worried about giving some or, or receiving some divine instruction as to whether this would be okay. Micaiah was the prophet at that particular time. So Ahab, King Ahab was mortally wounded there at Ramoth Gilead and he died from his wounds. And as we looked at uh, verse 29 of the previous chapter, obviously Joram has now been wounded as well. So that this is interesting, interesting because it's showing is that Jehu, now mid-30s, of course, he's out on the battlefield. He's not cringing in some dark corner wondering, well, you know, who's going to do something as far as the nation is concerned? I mean, I guess sometimes in ecclesial life we just step back and we say, I wonder who's going to do something. So, well, Jehu was, was not cringing in some dark corner. He's out there defending the nation. And now he's going to go to the next level where he starts to remove and eradicate the wickedness out of the nation because he's been anointed by one of the sons of the prophets. So it's almost as though, you know, the spirit of Elijah is now seen in this man himself. Remember, Elijah had been on the battlefield up at Mount Carmel, had been disappointed with the nation, and he wondered where it was all going to go, and that command came, well, you go and anoint um, Jehu. He didn't get around to that, but Jehu certainly was almost in the footsteps of Elijah, almost the same spirit of Elijah. So Jehu was a captain in the army of Israel. Obviously, as we progress in the narrative, we'll find that he had a great reputation amongst his own soldiers, his men. They supported him. And uh, he um, submitted, as we know, to the instructions of this son of the prophets. So he had a great reputation. He was a warrior. People obeyed him. He had in energy. He had enthusiasm and so we read in verse 2 of this introduction and there's a bit of a, a compression of his family there in verse 2 so it says look out there Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat the son of Nimshai now names are always important in the Bible because they give us a lesson and it's no different here so Jehu means Yahweh is he Yahweh is he Jehoshaphat means Yahweh is guide and Nimshi is very interesting. It means to rescue or to draw out. It's actually an extension of Moses' name. That word Nimshi comes from a root word that's used in Exodus 2 and verse 10, the word draw out. So Nim Nimshi means to rescue or to draw out, and it's an extension of Moses' name. So it's almost like, well, Jehu's now going to give a great exodus for the people of Israel. It's almost like an echo of what Moses achieved many years before. So when we put all that together, it's Yahweh is the guide who will rescue or draw out or extract Israel from their downward spiral. All right. So there we, we, we put that whole sentence together. So it really probably summarises what God was doing in the nation. Yahweh is the guide. He's going to rescue. He's going to draw out. He's going to extract Israel from their downward spiral and give them an opportunity of hope. So that's his name. So back to the narrative again. And very interesting in verse 3, um, Elisha says, Take the box of oil, pour it on his head, and say, Thus saith the I have anointed thee to be king over Israel, and then open the door and run. <laughs> sort of, what? It's rather strange, sort of, you know, one would imagine all the prestige of a, a anointing to be king would, would sort of have some elements of consideration. 
you know, gather all the men around, we'll have a, sort of some music and some trumpets playing and we'll, we'll anoint you and it'll be an amazing ceremony. It was none of that, it's like anoint him and then run. <laughs> and again, at the end of verse 10, well, the, the son of the prophet fulfilled that because end of verse 10 says he opened the door and, and ran. Well, this is going to be interesting. So who is this young man in verse 4? And you'll notice, again, I love how the narrative puts this, and it's really important for us to read the Bible as it is. Verse 4. So the young man, even the young man, well, you know, obviously he's emphasising to us this is a young man. Well, this is one of the nobodies nobody knows. But it's emphasising the narrative there that he's young, he had a focus, he had a determination. So you can imagine him perhaps as a, as a Nazarite, he's got these long flowing locks and he gets on his horse. Elijah's instructed to do, do this to anoint Jehu. He's on his horse, his, his black hair is flowing back, he comes thundering through the camp of Israel. He bursts into the inner sanctum of the uh, commanders and, and the chiefs are all discussing their strategy. Uh, and they say, what are you doing here? And he says, I'll come with a message. And they say, well, who for? And he says, well, you, O king. And so they go into this sort of inner room and then next minute this Nazarite comes running out and he's on his horse and he's off like, well, that was all over in a couple of minutes. So really it's the spirit of Elijah, isn't it? Like where it says there at the end of verse 3, he opened the door and fled and the introduction there. Remember how we're introduced to Elijah? I mean, this is a, almost a carryover to the same attitude that Elijah had. Remember Elijah appears in face of Ahab and Jezebel, just the, the doors burst open in the palace and he says, there's not going to be any rain. And it disappears. So it's almost an echo of that. So very energetic, very d decisive, and what a mission to, to carry out. But there's an interesting thing. He obviously expands on uh, what he's saying to Captain Jehu because we've got that in you know, verse 5, 6, uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10. But what's interesting, I'd like to just pick out a little phrase in verse 6. So it says there, he rose, uh, went into the house, he poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people, the people of Yahweh, even over Israel. It's almost like a, a couple of levels there, isn't there? But did you notice the phrase, the people of Yahweh? I mean, these are the northern tribes. These are the people who have been suffering under the irrepressible hand of Ahab and Jezebel, all the prophets of Baal, and all their worldly worship. And these people had been led astray in, in a horrible way. And we may have imagined that under the hand of Ahab and Jezebel, God had completely disregarded all those northern tribes. Uh, you know, their wayward... They don't understand the truth. They should be forgotten and taken off into captivity. But it's, it's quite wonderful, isn't it? Because in that verse 6, it's my people of Israel. And in verse 7, we have it added, my servants, the prophets, the servants of Yahweh. So God remembered his original promise to exterminate the house of Ahab and Jezebel and give reprieve to the northern people. And so there's this special expression there, I have anointed you to be king over the people of Yahweh. The people of Yahweh. Doesn't that show God's incredible mercy? Here's a wayward people influenced by Jezebel, rejecting the temple worship because they'd set up cars in Dan and Bethel. But God still accounted them as his people. And he now motivated Jehu to, to move and to make some change in that, in that environment in the hope that his people would turn again to true worship. Well, I think that's pretty amazing and that's very encouraging for us in our own lives, isn't it? Because sometimes we think, or we, perhaps we've made a decision or we've placed ourselves in an environment that's disconnected us from God. And we tend to think, well, you know, I've made this decision, it's a bad decision, but I guess I've just got to live with it and, you know, God doesn't like me anymore. And that's not the case because here we have a, a very clear incident that even although 
these people had suffered and, and, and gone down a, a bad pathway, God was still wanting to protect them, encourage them and develop them. And that's the same for us, brothers and sisters, when we make a bad decision or we find ourselves in a dark space, let's never think that God's forgotten us or doesn't want us for the kingdom. He's given us an invitation and like the people in, in this situation, he wants to draw us out and to encourage us and give us direction. Peter puts it this way, 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, you're a don't forget this, he says, you're a chosen generation, you've been called to a royal priesthood, you are to be a holy nation, you are a special people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. I mean, that's almost the duplication there in the New Testament of Peter saying, let's not forget the graciousness with which God has reached out and touched us. And again, I just think it's so lovely that in this terrible environment, this darkness, this blackness, this waywardness of this people, that they're called the people of Yahweh. Just quite amazing. And I wonder, do we realise how special we are in the sight of God? We have the, you know, seven billion people, there's just a handful of us who've come to open the Bible to think about God and his ways and try and recalibrate our lives. Well, Malachi says this, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, he says, those that fear Yahweh, they spake often one to another. It's what we're doing tonight. It's what we're doing right now. And Yahweh hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written for him, for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name, and Yahweh said, they're going to be mine, and I'm going to make them my jewels. So, you know, tonight we've come together to spend an hour talking about the things of God, and in the sight of God, that's very precious. He's made a note of that. And I think that can be very encouraging for us, depending on what particular pathway we're on, that God still wants us to be part of his treasure in that kingdom that will soon be established. Well, of course, this young man had an incredible commission. Um, you know, it wasn't that uh, he had something nice to say. I mean, we all like to have conversations and to compliment people and say nice things about people. It's not very often that we, you know, come face to face, eyeball to eyeball with someone and give them a good dressing down. But, I mean, this is the message. You're going to destroy the family of your master Ahab. I'm going to revenge, get revenge on Jezebel for the shedding of the blood of my servants and the prophets and all Yahweh's servants. Ahab's entire family will die. I'm going to destroy every male from Ahab's family, whether slave or freeman. I'm going to make Ahab's family like the family of Jeroboam and like the family of Baasha. God will leave Jezebel inside the walls of Jezreel and no one will bury her. And he ran. <laughs> Well, you can imagine after sort of that ferocious message, you're not going to hang around for a compliment. I mean, that's a fairly brutal statement and a, a brutal commission to give to someone. This is what you need to do. Well, the prophets certainly had a lifetime of giving warnings to individuals and nations, but this is really quite uh, confronting, this message that was taken to Jehu, and the message was you're going to take out the king and you're going to take out the whole dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel and anyone who's associated with them. You need to do that. So it was a wake-up call for Jehu and a wake-up call for the nation. And I wonder whether sometimes, you know, we need a wake-up call because we've become very tolerant, haven't we? I mean, society now uh, is very embracing on, on, on any sort of lifestyle and you're looked as intolerant if, if you don't accept or embrace. I mean, here's Parliament just a few years ago. Uh, they're all hugging, they're kissing one another. They've just approved same-sex marriages, you know, legally across Australia. And this now is filtering down to all of us. And, you know, are, are we respecting God's principles? Or, you know, are we sort of embracing this aspect of toleration? And as a little note there, sadly in our day, it's considered worse to judge evil than to do evil. You know, if, if you make a statement about people's lifestyle, uh, then that's considered evil. That's particularly sad. So this is a wake-up call that Jehu was commissioned that the people of God should no longer tolerate the evil in their midst. You know, when we, we have to disfellowship someone, we cringe a little bit, don't we? Um, we don't like disfellowship at all. Sometimes brothers and sisters just walk away from the truth. They don't want anything to do with it. And we have to get to that point where we say, well, you know what? Uh, you're no longer in fellowship with us because you're taking a completely different pathway. And this is really sort of what that's about in a modern day context. 
And obviously it's right, as we do now, to be very cautious about that process because we want to encourage brothers and sisters to recalibrate themselves back on a right pathway. So we're very cautious about going down that particular pathway. We, we want repair and rebuilding rather than extermination. But just imagine if that was you and you got that commission. Imagine yourself as Jehu and this young guy with flowing locks comes in, he's a Nazarite, and he tells you that you've got to go and speak roughly to some brothers and sisters uh, and tell them to get out of here because you're a bad influence. Do you reckon you could do it? I don't think I could. This is a very tough commission. But perhaps in an age of tolerance, brothers and sisters, we need to draw a line in the sand, do we? Is this, is this the lesson that, that's here in the context of this chapter? That God had had enough and he's now commissioning Jehu to go draw a line in the sand and to say to brothers and sisters, hey, get your lives in order. You can't just plateau. Maybe that's a lesson to us as well, that we've become comfortable uh, as far as perhaps our, our own morality is concerned. We need to draw a line in the sand. A little question there. Do you actually have a line in the sand? Where is it? Do you draw it? Have you ever drawn a line in the sand? Have to say, no more. So that's very strong language, of course, but for ourselves, you know, we, we've got to, again, revisit this and perhaps question as to, to where we are as far as our spiritual development is concerned. Now, we might find that commission or that language that that young man had to say to Jehu a little bit confronting, a little bit, well, was it over the top? But you know what? The most merciful man that has ever lived uses the same sort of language. And here it is here. It's the language of Jesus. It's in the book of Revelation. It's about people that he finds offensive. Again, Revelation 2.20 says, I've got a few things to say against you because you suffer that woman Jezebel or her teachings or her immorality or her uh, lackadaisical attitude she calls herself a prophet, yes, and she wants to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. I'm going to kill her children with death. I mean, that's, that's the statement of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, we, we, we might cringe when we, we, we read that radical statement there, but in actual fact, God wants us to be serious about our life and the truth. It's not just about coasting along uh, and sort of dabbling in ev everything and hoping we'll make the kingdom and God's mercy will be a, a wonderful umbrella for us. No, we've got to draw a line in the sand, we've got to be faithful, we've got to be committed, and we've got to live the morality that God expects us to live. So that language, of course, is very, very um, confronting. So it would take a lot of courage for both this young man to deliver the message and also for Jehu. Think about Jehu. He's just been commissioned to rebuild a nation, to rebuild an ecclesia, rebuild people. He's the only one that knows this message at this particular stage. And he takes it on board. And it wasn't just pure bloodlust. I mean, obviously, he was just doing this for, you know, well, you know, this would be an interesting sideline to my uh, daily occupation. No, his commission is to be king and leader of the people of God. And it wasn't just that aspect of kingship that who wanted to embrace. He went beyond that, didn't he? He didn't just sort of put himself on the throne, didn't remove the kings and say, well, I'm here now, I'm the king, I'm going to enjoy great life, I'm going to kick back a little bit and, you know, have some time for myself. No, he was very, very thorough. He actually had a commitment to the things of God. He was absolutely thorough. He wanted to remove every solitary influence, bad influence from the nation. So he didn't leave it half done once he was king. So, you know, this message was, was given, and verse 11, it says, uh, Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, and they said, Well, you know, what's going on? You'll notice this little, pr little phrase, um, is it well, in verse 11? Is it well? It's the same in verse 17. At the end of verse 7, it's got, is it peace? That word well is the, well sh the word shalom. Is it shalom? Is it peace? Is everything Okay. Same as the end of verse 17, is it peace? Same at the end of verse 19, or, or halfway through, is it peace? 19, and in verse 22, is it peace, Jehu? All right, so it's a sort of a, a, is everything fine? Is everything going okay? Now, I think 
in verse 11, we've got a little bit of a, a sense of humour in the Bible. You know, we often say, well, is there any humour in the Bible? It seems to be a very serious book. But if you look at the narrative and you paint the picture, it's got to be pretty funny because in verse 11, these captains, these men around Jehu saying, what's with this guy? I mean, he's just coming here. He's, you know, he's got long ears. He's a Nazarite. He's probably one of these sons of the prophets. He's a weirdo. He's mad. You know, he's bad. He, these guys just babble about nothing. They're totally mean. He's full of crazy rubbish and lies. What did he say? And Jehu says, well, he said, I'm going to be king. And then you notice in the narrative, they scrabbled around, threw off their garments, said, Jehu's king. So, so much for all this, you know, mad, madness and, and babbling. Suddenly they believed it. And, you know, within two minutes, they're, they're throwing their garments down saying, oh, Jehu's king. So... Sort of a, a, a funny scenario, but perhaps it also gives us a bit of an insight into Jehu because he was supposed to be in an inner chamber with this message. You notice in verse 2, right at the end of verse 2, it says, and carry, take him into an inner chamber. He, the margin says, um, chamber, inner chamber. All right, so this young prophet, son of the prophet, could have given the message in front of those men before, couldn't he? But he took Jehu right into an inner chamber. The reason, obviously, is to give Jehu time to absorb the message and to build a strategy, which Jehu didn't do. He just came out and said, well, I'm going to be king, and then everyone scrabbled around and bowed before him. So, you know, it seems as though Jehu was a little bit belligerent, maybe. He's not sort of harmonious, and he didn't really plan this little scenario as well as he could have. And the point is that God uses all different types of people, doesn't he? You know, within our, I won't say within our ecclesia, but within the ecclesia of God, sometimes we have people that are quite blunt. I don't mind blunt people. I'm okay with blunt people, and I think they deliver a good message and sometimes it's a bit hard to digest, but I say at least they're honest and they're truthful. Most of us tiptoe around people. We don't want to offend them. But Jehu was sort of a person who was, I, I guess he's pretty blunt, and he just said it as he thought it, and he delivered as it should have been delivered. So I don't think we should always discard a message from a, from a blunt brother or sister because maybe there's some genuineness in what, what they're saying. I always remember the early MIC class when we were young brethren and we used to, you know, we thought we delivered one of the greatest talks ever and then there'd be a few brethren that stood up and said, you know, that was probably the worst talk I've ever heard. You obviously didn't prepare and it was delivered, you know, you mumbled or whatever. So it was always good for us to take criticism on board and I, I think sometimes that can be helpful. So you notice there, of course, that they're throwing all their garments down. Oh, Jehu's going to be king. There's a little reference now in verse 16. Um, so Jehu's now on his chariot and he's heading to Jezreel. I mean, it's as though he didn't even stop for a breath. It's like just rolling through now. He's going to be king. So Jehu rides in a chariot, verse 16. He's going to Jezreel for Joram lay there. And here's this big mistake from Ahaziah. Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down. See that word down? It's not down. To see Joram. Well, if you look at a map, geographically, Jezreel from Judah is up. But of course, it's, it's talking uh, about spiritually, he's made a big mistake. He's gone down. And of course, Ahaziah, he's going to lose his life. He's only been on the throne for less than a year. All right? He, less than a year. He's come uh, to connect to him because he's related to Jor Joram is his uncle, right, through marriage. So he's come well, down or up, however geographically you want to imagine it. He's related to his uncle here through marriage because he's the son of Jehoram and Athaliah. And Athaliah is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Big, big mistake. So what's happening here? Well, here's a little uh, uh, geographical map so you can see what's going on. Here's Ramoth Gilead. Okay, so this is where Jehu was, and he's going to come down. This, this is Jezreel today, all right? This is the Jezreel Valley. This is the, where um, the, king, the king was. Uh, this, that's Jezreel there. This is Mount Gilboa here. You remember a battle with Saul. Saul and Jonathan lost their lives there. This is the Valley of Jezreel, and uh, this is the road that Jehu would have, you know, rode his chariot. This is the Jordan Valley here, and across there, of course, is eastward, Edom and Moab. So that's where Ramoth Gilead was. So Jehu is coming up to this town of Jezreel. Verse 17, a watchman sees, 
He spies a company, verse 17. So there's a whole host of men. They were supporting Jehu. And of course, uh, here they come in their chariots. There's a multitude of them. And we notice in verse 20, a couple of uh, messengers go out to see what's going on. And they turn behind Jehu. And there's a little note there, and I guess this is probably the main thing we always all remember about Jehu. It says his, tri- his driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshai. He driveth furiously. So that word driveth in verse uh, 20 is the Hebrew word nahag, and it means to impel, a determination to have focus. So it's as though his chariot's swaying erratically. He's driving furiously. It's almost as though it's up on one wheel. What's interesting is that word... And I never realised this. The same word, this word driveth, is used in 1 Chronicles 13, verse 7. I'm not going to go there. But this is when um, Uzzah and Ohio drove the car. 1 Chronicles 13, verse 7 says, They carried the ark of God in a new car out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ohio drove the car, and the oxen stumbled. It's almost, you get the sense that uh, these two men want to get rid of the rid of the ark they dumped it on a cart and they you know bashed the the oxen to get going and the oxen sort of lurch off and they're away and they're driving it and the oxen stumble and the, remember the ark fell and Uzzah put out his hand to stop it so it's as though they sort of wanted to get rid of this and, and on its way and it's the same word here that's used of Jehu uh, it says he, he at the end of verse 20 he drives furiously you, you margin will have the word madness it's the Hebrew word shige on it. Strong defines it as craziness. So he's got a known reputation for this particular driving. He's a persistent, intensive, determined, resolute person. And you can get the idea of who he is from the end of verse 24, which we'll look at in our next session. Verse 24, Jehu drew a bow with his full strength. All right, so what it's telling us is he never did anything half-hearted. If he's driving a chariot, he's going flat out. If he's pulling a, 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 an arrow back, it's going to be with his full strength. There's vigour and there's determination. Now, it can be a good quality. All right, Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, because once you're dead, there's nothing. There's no work, device, knowledge, wisdom in the grave where you're going to go. So... The lesson to us is like what we're doing in the truth, we need to have our full energy involved in it. This is not something we do part-time. We're not part-timers. We're 100% committed to growing in our relationship with God. And so this is Jehu. He's a very determined person. In fact, if you just come over the page to chapter 10 and verse 16, there's another incident we'll look at at a further session. Uh, and I sort of like the, the, the way the narrative... It's presented. He meets up with Jonadab, the Rechabite. And uh, verse 16 says, this is Jehu. Jehu says, come with me and see my zeal for Yahweh. And then it says, so they made him ride in his chariots. As though Jonadab's thinking, I, I don't want to get in the chariot with this guy. You know, where's, where's the seatbelt? Where's the, where's the, the safety harness? Um, it's like he, they, they made him ride in the chariot. So he's reluctant to do it. Well, what's interesting about that word furious is the word madness, and there's only two other occasions. Deuteronomy 28, verse 28. It says, God will smite you with madness and blindness. Zechariah 12, verse 4 is the only other reference. And it says, in that day I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. It's talking about the world that we're living in. Zechariah is talking about the time when the world will become mad, there'll be... Nations will be assembling themselves at Jerusalem. There'll be a whole spirit of madness. Armageddon will blow up and fortunately Jesus will return. So this furiousness, which is a part of the character of Jehu, is sort of seen in the way people behave erratically without too much thought. Spirit of madness. And really it's, it's used in Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14 to describe the whole atmosphere, the environment of people in the world, frustrated, furious, angry, erratic. I mean, this, we're seeing that. So Revelation 16, 13 and 14 says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. They are de- demonic spirits. They're spirits of madness. And it says they're going to go forward to all the kings of the earth. 
Well, that's liberty, equality, fraternity, the spirit of the French Revolution that we're seeing now, this spirit of madness that's just encompassing the earth. And Jehu, of course, is that sort of person in, in one sense, is he's got a, a particular focus of eradicating, in, in this context, it's probably a good thing, because he wants to remove all the evil, all the wickedness uh, in that, those northern territories so that this can become a place of worship for God. Will he succeed or not? Well, I guess that's going to be our, our future ses sessions that will uncover that. So what are some of the lessons then we've learned in this brief sort of introduction to Jehu and the man that he was? Well, here's the takeaways. Jehu was known for his leadership, his enthusiasm and his focus. He had a reputation. Uh, once that message came out, all his, his captains threw off their, their robes and says, you, you're king because they knew he was that sort of person. What sort of reputation do you think you have with other brothers and sisters? What, you know, what are the qualities that you're known for? Is it, is it focus and determination? Is it love of the truth? Is it consistency? You have to answer that, same here. Uh, he did not delay when he received his anointing and the task he was appointed for. Are we consistent supporters of ecclesial functions or do we find them inconvenient? I mean, when we look at our life in the truth, I understand it's not you know, just because we come here we get a tick. But it is part of who we are. We enjoy fellowship with each other. It's like Malachi says, we speak to one another about the things of God. This is what we like. This is what we love. Is that who we are? Uh, he was clearly decisive and focused on the path ahead. And again, you know, do we have focus or is this just a part-time sort of interruption to our week? He was told to totally eradicate evil and wickedness from the kingdom. The question is, are we fighting that battle with the same intensity or have we given up? You know, again, we talk about the tolerance that is thrust upon us in our workplaces. You know, if we go into university, wherever we are, have we been influenced by that? Have we become a little bit more tolerant than we should be? Or are we carrying the spirit of Jehu who, who has an intensity for right and wrong, draws a line, that's clear for him. So there are the opening lessons, brothers and sisters, as we continue to look at the life of this very enthusiastic man who wanted to do initially what was right for God. It is a, a certainly a, a dramatic time in Israel's history, and I think we can extrapolate some personal lessons for us. Jehu actually becomes a challenge to us because he has a lot of energy and enthusiasm for the things of God. And for those of us that have been in the truth for a long, long time, of course, this is, this is helpful to us because it, it means that we want to re-energise ourselves in preparation for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we've um, shown before, of course, we've got a, a series of five studies that we want to do. And in our last session, we had a look at selection. Remember, the uh, son of the prophet came to anoint um, Jehu. He did so with enthusiasm, and um, Jehu was off and running. And we saw the, the finish point where he was sort of driving towards Jezreel, uh, ready to exterminate the, the dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel. So tonight, we want to have a look a little bit more about the seriousness of Jehu. Uh, it wasn't just a flash in the pan. It wasn't just that he wanted to be king and so, you know, he wanted to usurp the uh, existing dynasty and take the throne for himself. He wanted more than that. He actually wanted to remove um, anyone who had a bad influence upon the nation of Israel. And you remember we point out in verse 6 that he was anointed so that he could create an environment for the people of Israel to return to their God. And the particular phrase here in verse 6 is the people of the Lord. And we might have thought, of course, the northern territory of course was all um, completely astray from the truth and, and disconnected from God but here in this particular phrase that was his commission uh, to restore again the environment so the people of God could return to their right worship and he took that seriously and we'll see that tonight. So he had a very clear understanding of what his commission was to do. He had zero tolerance for anyone who was a bad influence, anyone who was distracting from the worship of God and he wanted to restore that environment again. And he had that energy and that enthusiasm. He just didn't, 
didn't drag his heels and say, well, you know, I'll sort of organise things and, and eventually we'll, this will happen. He just went full on into removing this, this whole dynasty and anyone that was connected with Baal worship. So, as we've said tonight, our subject is um, seriousness. Uh, we've got this particular section that we've just read and our key verse for sure, and, and it's going to be challenging for us, is verse 24 where he draws this bow with his full strength. And you can see that determination, that focus that he has on exploring the opportunity to open up an environment for right worship for his God. So, you know, we might have had a pre preconceived idea that Jehu was just a military machine. I think we'll find out tonight that he's more than that. He really wanted to begin a new process in the land of Israel. So we begin at verse 21. Here's where we uh, left off last session. And we notice there, remember that Jehu was coming in with his chariot. He, he wheels into the, the city of, of Jezreel and he's going to take out these kings and the queen, of course, all in a day. So verse 21 the, the king has sent out a couple of watchmen, remember, and they were wondering why Jehu was coming down, obviously, with a bit of an entourage. They presumed that it was going to be good news, that he'd had success on the battlefield. They didn't know that this was a, a rebellion or an assassination attempt. So they're going to saddle up, they're going to go out because he's the general chief of staff, uh, and they're going to inquire, how's it going on the battlefield? You're bringing good news. So they didn't know, they weren't aware of, of what was going to unfold. So verse 21, Joram says, make ready, and his chariot raid was made ready. He's the king, of course. So both the kings, king of Judah and king of Israel, went out to um, meet Jehu on his way in. Now you notice there's a great little phrase here in this narrative. It says, they each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu and met him significantly in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. So there's, there's a geographical marker that's injected into this verse that is particularly important. Now you'll notice in your margin you've got King James on that word met. It actually gives the Hebrew word as found. So they found him in the field of Naboth. Now Jehu has already set this up because there's a bit of background. He knows the prophecy by uh, Elijah many years before against Ahab that there was going to be judgment meted out on Ahab himself in the field of Naboth. So he doesn't go screaming in to the city of Jezreel. He stops in the field of Naboth. And that's that, that Hebrew word there, matzah. Margin says he found. First occurrence, here's an example, Genesis 2 verse 20 is the first occurrence. It says there was not found for Adam a help for him. So it's not just they met or some random chance that, well, they happened to cross paths in the, in the field of Naboth. It's Jehu came in and they found him in, in that particular area. So it's as though he was waiting in that spot to execute his commission. So again, you know, just this little background. He's not just going in for the kill. There's a whole spiritual significance of fulfilling a prophecy and a commission originally given by Elijah. And now he's going to execute the rightness and the justness of God. Well, so, you know, as they come in, their question in verse 22 is, is it peace? That word peace, we point out, is the word shalom. Is everything happened? It's probably a, a fairly typical greeting uh, in, in Israel today. But, of course, what's really interesting, and I think we probably coloured in these, or maybe you didn't last session, and it's worthwhile colouring in, because this is a repeated phrase right through this particular chapter over six times. The question is, is it peace? Of course, the answer is no, because the nation is infested with evil. So there, there is no peace, of course. And right through that narrative, that's, that's the question. And it was Jehu's task originally to establish a form of peace. And as we've got there, true peace only comes when there's an eradication of evil. We understand that, we know that, that's why we want the return of Jesus Christ. And this world is, is such a complex world, it's such a frustrating world. Uh, it's a world that's full of a, a lot of issues and problems on, on many different levels. But until corruption and evil and wickedness is removed, it'll, it'll be always the same thing. So that's the whole plan and purpose of God is to remove that. And then true peace, shalom, happiness will be for all people. So those phrases are repeated. And of course, we've got the, uh, the qualifying quotations there in Isaiah 57. It says, the wicked are like a troubled sea. I can't rest, the water's cast up mire and dirt. There's turbulence there. We see that in our world today. People are unrestful, they're unhappy, they want some change, they want some newness. They can't find it. 
And so the quote says, No peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Again, in Isaiah 59, they don't know the way of peace. And Jeremiah chapter 8 uh, says, They'd heal, They have healed the wound of my people, that's Israel, lightly. They said, Oh, look, it's not a big issue, of course. And they're saying, Peace, peace. These prophets who are giving very depressive messages, it's not going to happen. There's going to be peace. And God says, well, there's not going to be peace at all while there's evil in existence. So this was the big commission for Jehu, was, of course, to remove that so that there would be peace. So what's, what's his answer? So the kings come out, Shalom, is it peace? Is it well? Is it good news? And they, they meet a rebuttal by Jehu in verse 22. And he says, well, what peace? So long as the whoredoms of your mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. So Jehu had no time for Jezebel and her excess practices as far as Baal worship or Asher, Asher worship and idolatry and murder were concerned. He had no time for Jezebel or Ahab or that whole system at all. So again, he's not just strategically positioning himself so he could have the glory of the throne. He just didn't like that Baal worship at all. He wanted to be true and faithful worship of God. So this wasn't just about the practices uh, uh, that Jezebel had incorporated. There's a whole spiritual dimension and component to the deterioration of the nation of Israel, the state of the nation. He wasn't happy about it at all. So again, we're getting a little bit of an insight into this man Jehu and how his mind was working. Zero tolerance for evil and wickedness. So we note that the kings recognise that. They turn around in verse 23. They make a, a run for it. And, of course, we've got that little quote in verse 24 where, and I just love this characteristic attribute of Jehu. It's full-on strength. It says in verse 24, Jehu, drew, and, and the narrative really expands right out. I guess it's like a bow being pulled. Uh, Jehu drew a bow with his full strength, and he smote Jorm right between the arms, right, and the arrow went out on his heart. I mean, you couldn't get anything more dramatic or more descriptive, really. It's not like, you know, he pulled up and the arrow went and he died. It's like full strength. It tells us it smote him right between the shoulders and came out of his heart. I mean, that's a, that's a target hit if there was ever a target hit. So spot on, no mistaking, centre point, absolutely fatal for the king. And I think one translation says it went right through his heart. So we're getting an indication here of, of that strength that Jehu has when it comes to evil and wickedness and his desire to eradicate it. He went straight for the target, straight for the heart. And that's got to be a challenge for us. Here are some quotations to put against that little phrase, uh, with his full strength, because we've got to think about our own lives. No point just look studying this and, well, that's dramatic and that's interesting. Where do we sit when it comes to full strength and service to God? So here's some quotations to put against uh, verse 24, where that little phrase is full strength, because this is the challenge to us. And here's some individuals who put full strength into their service for God. Where, where do we sit with all that, brothers and sisters? You know, do we find it tough when it's a bit cold and we've got to come out, it's raining? Um, you know, these men really went through a lot of physical difficulties to demonstrate their love for God. That's what we do when we're here tonight. You know, credit to you all for coming out tonight and, and sitting together and opening God's word. It's a wonderful thing. Um, so here's, of course, Hezekiah. <coughs> It says, in every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God, in accordance with the law and command, see, he did it with his whole heart. He was fully invested in his service to his God. I might, have, might even say, you know, like 24-7. Uh, Ecclesiastes, of course, is obviously a great parallel. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, because there's nothing you know, beyond the opportunities that we have now to serve God. You know, once you get old to start to creep up into the 60s like I am, <laughs> or a little bit older, your physical faculties start, start to fail and you can't do it with full strength. And memories start to you know, blur a little bit more. So we need to take those opportunities. Uh, here's Caleb, Caleb and Joshua, Numbers 13.30. Caleb quieted the people. He said, no, we can go up, we can take this. You know, those giants, they're not giants at all. With God's strength, we can do this. We are well able to overcome it. Um, there's his energy for moving into the promised land. And then we go, jump across in the New Testament, these beautiful quotations by Paul. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a man, of course, who, who bore on his body 
many physical marks of persecution. And yet he continued to press forward. He said, I can do all these things. Colossians 3.22, he encouraged us, whatever you do, brothers and sisters, do it from the heart as to the Lord and not just unto men. It's our whole demeanour and our approach to life, whether that's our worth, work ethic or whether it's our behaviour, our attitude, our service to each other. Romans 12.11, don't be slothful, be fervent in, in spirit. And 1 Corinthians 9.24 Paul sort of talks about our walk to the kingdom, or our run to the kingdom. He says, in a race, there's lots of people running, but only one person gets the prize. The whole point. So he says, brothers and sisters, run like you want to be in first place. Now, we know, of course, in the kingdom, it's not going to be first, second, third prize that's handed out by Christ. But what he's saying is, you know, run like you want to win. Don't just, don't just you know, well, I hope it all works out, and fingers crossed I'm going to get a place in God's kingdom. It's like, well, there's got to be determination and full strength. So there, you know, some, it's an immediate challenge from the energy and the enthusiasm of Jehu as to, to where we are. Do we, here's the question, do we give full strength in our service to God? How serious are we about evil? And I think it's a great challenge for 2022. In a world that has blurred every moral boundary that you can think of, how serious are we about eradicating evil in our own lives? Because we sort of, you know, tolerate it now. Well, it's not a big deal, is it? Whereas for Jehu, arrow straight through to the heart, got rid of it. And that, that's a challenge to us. Do we accommodate evil? Do we tolerate it? Now, I can remember back when we were at Suburban, we were hosting Suburban. We were there with a lot of, you know, young people and we used to have pretty rigorous talks that were very straight down the line. I remember talking to a young brother after, he said, oh, that was an amazing talk uh, last week. He said, Uncle Steve, I went home and I snapped 200 CDs in half. This is when you used to put CDs in cars and play, you know, rock music. <laughs> and he had apparently quite a big collection. But he was so enthusiastic about a particular talk, he said, I went home and I snapped 200 CDs in half and put them in the bin. <laughs> and I always remember that because I thought, wow, that's uh, amazing. That, um, but, but it's right, isn't it? I mean, we listen to talks, we go home, we yawn, we go home and life continues on. So, you know, these are challenges for us that are really good. And I see Jehu, as he pulled that, you know, right, and I've sort of, and Mike is going to laugh at this, but we went to Texas a few years ago and there's a brother that had a bow and arrow and I could not draw the bow back. <laughs> I tried a couple of times. I got to about here and then I oh, just couldn't do it. So I fully appreciate the strength that Jehu's got. Full strength, straight to the target, straight through the heart. Incredible. So, uh, and why is he doing this? Is it just because he wants to be on the throne? No, look at this narrative now in verse 25. Then said Jehu to Bidka, his captain, throw his body in the field of, of, of Naboth. For I remember when you and I rode together with Ahab, his father, Yahweh laid this burden upon him. Now, I like that word, I remember. That was 15 years before. 15 years before when he was riding with Bidkar as bodyguards to Ahab. A conversation that he remembered occurred between Ahab and Elijah. So you wind back to 2007, 15 years ago, 2007. Can you remember a phrase, a talk, a point in a study that resonated with you that you know, you've carried for 15 years thinking, that, that was a great point. That changed my life. Because Jehu did. He remembered a conversation that occurred 15 years before and it resided in his mind and now it was going to be outplayed and fulfilled. So he obviously is a general or chief of staff in the army. He continued to serve Ahab, but he didn't agree with Ahab's immorality and his rejection of God. He didn't agree with it at all. So he cites in verse 25 and 26 uh, the, the prophecy that was given by Elijah. And he, he knew that because he was there. He heard that pronunciation. And ESV says, when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab. Now, this is, I happen to look up a few Assyrian inscriptions and this is basically some inscriptions obviously from the Assyrian Empire and you can see here they ride together. So it's not just on the back of a horse or you know in a chariot by yourself. Here's 
Here they are here. They're all in this particular chariot together. And here's one. You can see here's the king here. And here's all his bodyguards around. So obviously Jehu heard that whole conversation and that pronouncement by Elijah. So he had every justification to take Ahab out. He heard that conversation. I mean, he's the top military man. He could have taken Ahab out at any point because he would have felt that he's fulfilling a divine commission, but he waited for that particular anointing. But here's the interesting point, and he adds something in which is not in the previous record. I'm going to go there in a minute, but look at verse 26. Uh, this is what he recalls the conversation. He says, surely I've seen yesterday the blood of Naboth, and here it is, and the blood of his sons, saith Yahweh. So if you think about the story of Naboth, I know Pip did it last year or the year before. I don't know if you remember, but it wasn't just Naboth that died. We've probably got, just come back to um, 1 Kings 21, because it's, it's mentioned, well, it's not mentioned here, actually. If you read the record from 1 Kings 21, you would never know that Ahab and Jezebel basically took out the whole family. So when you come to 1 Kings 21 and verse 13, it uh, just talks about um, two men, uh, children of worthlessness, and they sat and the whole thing happened. But at the end of verse 13, it says, Then they carried him, singular, forth out of the city and stoned him, singular, with the stones that he died, singular. And then they sent a message to Jezebel saying, Well, Naboth's dead. You wouldn't know. The, the, the sons, plural, were killed as well. They took out the whole family, so Ahab could possess that particular plot of land. So Jehu was there. He heard all this. He knew all this. He hated it. He hated the brutality and the callousness and the injustice of this Ahab and Jezebel and an innocent man, Naboth, and they killed his sons as well, who had the right to inheritance, Jehu didn't like that at all. Now, you might say, well, why was Jehu a warrior? Why was he still serving Ahab? Well, he could, because he believed that Israel had a right to their inheritance. That's the whole point. He was fighting against these other nations because he believed that was God's land. That was God's promise. He was defending the inheritance. So to see and to witness someone removed, killed, murdered inappropriately would have been quite distasteful for him. But Jehu, like, we might even say like David. Remember, David was anointed as king, but for 15 years he ran through the wilderness, waiting, 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 waiting for the moment when God would open a pathway for him to become king. So Jehu parallels in a very similar way uh, David's attitude as well. So Ahab died in battle 12 years before this incident we're, we're talking about tonight, when Jehu finally killed Ahab. Uh, killed um, the other king, Joram. So he died 12 years previous to that, but Jehu knew that there were still some details in this prophecy that had not been fulfilled. So in some sense, like David, he was waiting for a commission, for an anointment, for a direction from God to fulfil that. And here it comes. It's here in this 1 Kings 21, verse 23. Here's a part of the prophecy that had not been fulfilled, because Ahab died... 12 years before, but Jezebel was still alive. So verse 23, and he heard this conversation with Elijah, and of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, dogs will eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Just have a look at your margin as well on that word wall. It's the word ditch, isn't it? See, Jehu heard this conversation, and he's actually going to fulfil it to the letter that remained unfulfilled and that was very specific about how Jezebel was going to die. She wasn't going to die on the field of Naboth, she wasn't going to die on a battlefield, she was going to die in a ditch and Jehu was going to make sure that that was fulfilled. So what I'm saying is Jehu is not just a military person, he likes to kill people. He actually wants to re-establish a right environment for worship. And here's, here's the point, just come back to our chapter 2 Kings 9. There's another little colouring in point here. Jehu is citing not his own authority. He's not saying, look, I'm doing this because you're a nasty person and I want to get rid of your mother because uh, you're a nasty fan. He doesn't say that at all. He says it's by the word of God. 
So he knew the prophecy, he knew his Bible, and here it is here. Four times I was with Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I've seen you said the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. Seth the Lord, and I'll requite thee in this place. Seth the Lord. Now therefore take a cast him in that uh, place of the ground according to the word of the Lord. So that's a, a little phrase worth colouring in. Four times, Jehu is not saying, well, this is what I want. He's saying, this is part of the fulfilment of the word of God. Now, and come across to verse 36. Because again, in verse 36, he quotes the words of Elijah. Verse 36, wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, well, that's great, you know, this is my doing, I'm glad I got rid of Jezebel. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, this is the word of Yahweh which he spake by Elijah. So he gives credibility to God and to his word. So for Jehu, he waited until the time came when that opportunity opened up. Do we have, here's the question again, do we have the same energy, the same enthusiasm in, enthusiasm in wanting to establish and progress the kingdom of Christ? Because when the command comes for us to clean up the world, morally, physically, spiritually, are we going to give full strength to engage with Christ and progress the kingdom? Because I think our viewpoint is, hey, I hope I get to the kingdom point and then, I don't know, I guess I'll be sitting under a fig tree and relaxing. <laughs> it's just the opposite. This is like just our period of waiting, like Jehu. And when the anointing or the command comes, we will have a thousand years now with full strength to go out and to establish the kingdom. Is that what we want? Is that what we're really waiting for? Because that's got to be the focus, not me just getting the kingdom. It's me changing the world with Jesus Christ to make it a better place for everybody to worship God. So we've got to be looking forward to beyond the judgment seat to transforming this world into the place that God wants it to be. So when that command comes for us, brothers and sisters, what a relief, what a privilege, what a joy. How much enthusiasm we'll have to change this world so that it becomes a nice place for everybody. So he cites in verse 25, 26, the words of God. And uh, that, that was particularly important for Jehu, of course, to fulfil. And again, New Testament quotation across in Peter. It says, all flesh is like grass. People come, people go. The glory of man is like a flower of the, the grass. The grass withers and the flower fades away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And you've got that gospel message that is enduring. So that's something that's permanent and solid and reliable for us in a very transitory world. So verse 27, there's another little point here, very interesting. Verse 27 says, When Ahaziah, king of Judah, so Joram, king of Israel, had an arrow through his heart. He's dead. His body's been put out in the field of Naboth. Ahaziah now in verse 27, king of Judah, thinks, oh, I'm going to make a run for it because he's after me as well. It says he fled by the way of the, the garden house. It's almost an echo, isn't it, of, of Naboth and Ahab, uh, the, the confrontation they had. Remember, Ahab said, I want this for a garden. I mean, this was Naboth's vineyard. And now history almost is, is, is being justified as this king fled by the way of a, a garden house. ESV says he fled in the direction of Beth Hagan, a slight translation. So we don't know whether it's a place um, or just the way the King James, but interesting um, analogy anyway. So Ahaziah is on the run. He's 23 years of age. He's been on the throne for 12 months. Uh, his mother is Athaliah, who was the sister of the king that's just his body's been thrown in the field of Naboth. So there's a big family interconnection going on here. He's 23. He's only been on the throne for one year. That's, all, that, that's the length of his reign. So he heads off, and the record at the end of verse 27 says he headed off to Megiddo, which was a big fortress town. Didn't make it, uh, and the record there says, uh, and, he, and he died there. But I want you to go to... Um, 2 Chronicles 22, verse 9, because this is a, the parallel record in Chronicles. It adds another little really interesting detail, because from that narrative there in Kings, you get the picture, well, uh, it looks, looks like King Ahaziah just made a run for it, but somehow he, he died. Was he wounded or, or what happened? 
Well, 2 Chronicles 22 verse 9 fills in the picture for us and shows the energy and the enthusiasm that Jehu and his men around him had for eradicating evil. 2 Chronicles 22 verse 8 says, It came to pass that when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, etc., etc., um, he slew them. Verse 9, look at verse 9. And he sought Ahaziah, and they caught him. He was hiding in Samaria, and they brought him to Jehu, and they slew him there. <coughs> so, point is, Jehu didn't let him get away. He could have probably shrugged, shrugged, shrugged his shoulders and said, well, you know, best of luck to him. He's making a run for it. After all, he's the king of Judah. Maybe we should let him go. No, he was connected to the dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel. He was an evil and wicked man. Jehu sought for him, found him, and killed him. So again, this is indicating the thoroughness of Jehu. He didn't leave any stone unturned. He wanted to remove every bad influence. And of course... The lesson coming out to us is that we've got to be careful with our associations, don't we, with our friendships, especially when it comes to people in the world. Not that, of course, we're going to shut the door or not have a conversation with anyone. We've got to live in this world. We want to be nice people. We want to communicate to everyone. We want to invite them to be part of the kingdom. So we do have to be friendly, of course, but the depth of our friendships, that's, that's an important thing. There are times where we have to draw a line in the sand and say, look, no, what you're asking me to be involved in, I don't want to be involved in at all. Because historically, of course, winding back a little bit, Jehoshaphat, remember, Jehoshaphat made an alliance with Ahab and with Jezebel, and he allowed his son to be married into that dynasty. And, of course, that gave rise to Athaliah, the evil, wicked woman, who now, down in Judah, was going to take control. Athaliah, of course, was in the dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel. She's going to kill all her grandkids and take the throne. I mean, what evil, wicked people they were. So the point of this little record here with this coordination between the king of Israel and the king of Judah is, hey, be careful of what association you make. It could <coughs> devastate, it could destroy you spiritually. Just be really careful. That, that is part of the point. And, of course, Paul picks that up as well in the New Testament, when in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the chapter on the resurrection, he just inserts this little comment. He says, don't fool yourselves, bad friends will destroy you. Well, that really came to pass as far as Ahaziah was concerned. He's a young guy. He'd only been on the throne for 12 months, got involved in the whole dynasty of the, the Northern Territories, and he ended up losing his life with Joram. Bad association, bad connection. Uh, and again, a couple of translations there. Don't be deceived. Um, bad company corrupts good morals. Uh, don't let anyone deceive you. Associating with bad people will ruin decent people. So we know as far as the world is concerned, we've got to be friendly, we've got to be nice, we've got to communicate. But the depth and the extent and the length of our friendships, we have to be very, very careful with that because if we allow it to go too far, it can destroy us, literally. So we've got to be careful with our friendship. So I'm just drawing a lesson on this association that the two kings had together, how inappropriate in some ways it was. And of course, um, we've got to be careful with our choices. And there's some beautiful quotations there. I don't know where to put that in 2 Kings chapter 9. I don't know, you know, verse 28 perhaps or 27, that this uh, connection of Ahaziah, king of Judah, with the king of Israel was not a good one. And... Um, you know, our choice of friends, our brothers and sisters, is really, really helpful for us. That's the positive element of friendship. It's great. Other brothers and sisters, you know, can give us advice and help and encouragement. Maybe they go through the same issues that we are. So he that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. That's exactly what happened to Ahaziah. And there's a, a few other quotations there as well. This one in a positive way, Malachi 3.16. Malachi um, 3.16. It talks about us, brothers and sisters, us here tonight. It says, those who feared the Lord got together, opened the Bible, talked about it, conversed about it, encouraged each other in it, and God noticed that, and a book of remembrance was written, for the friends and the brothers and sisters who feared Yahweh and, and respected his name. So, you know, what we're doing tonight is a good thing, and those friendships are particularly important. So, you know, in light of this cooperation between Joram uh, and Ahaziah, we've got to ask our few, ourselves some questions. 
I don't know where your friendships are extending to. We've got to ask ourselves this question. Who am I around? Who am I hanging around mostly? What are they doing to me? What have they got me reading? What, what, what are we absorbing ourselves in? What are we connecting with? What have they got me saying? Where do they have me going? Where do they have me thinking? And what do they have me becoming? Because people around us influence us in a positive or a negative way. Then ask yourself the big question. Is that okay? Because our life doesn't get better by chance, it gets better by choice. So that's all we're saying. From this association of Ahaziah and Jorah, bad, bad thing. They both lost their lives, bad decisions. We have to be careful with the depth of our friendships and what people are turning us into. When we're here around God's word, well, that's a great thing because that's a positive, renewing, upbuilding exercise. So, well, we come, of course, the narrative continues here in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30, two kings down, uh, one, one queen to go. Uh, verse 30 says, And when Jehu has come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face. <laughs> well, when you do the chronology, she's, 50, she's 55. Uh, no, no sort of implication or any of the older sisters that are 55 plus here but you know I don't know you, you know she obviously needs some face painting to make herself look you know quite presentable but the thing here you might go down the path of what she trying to do seduce Jehu make herself look nice no not at all she knew where Jehu was going to go he had a clear determination arrow through the heart Jezebel's not going to survive this so here's a demonstration of what a hard-hearted woman she was. She's going to challenge Jehu and dress herself like a queen in her final, final moments. So she hears the news. The news filters back. King has been assassinated. Ahaziah has also been assassinated. She knew that Jehu's not going to show any mercy, so she's going to dress herself as the queen mother and cast an insult into his face. I'm going to unpack that a little bit toward the end of the narrative. So she was such a cold-hearted uh, Tyrian sorceress, we might say, because she was from Tyre, uh, that she was ready to meet Jehu in that particular moment. So, you know, she painted her eyelashes and, and put on her jewels and, and put beautiful robe on, mounted up into the top of the tower and looked down through the lattice as Jehu's riding in and he comes thundering in with his chariot, with his men, and she hailed this triumphant usurper with a bitter insult the most bitterest of insults that she could cast into his face. So, where do we go with that? Well, you notice in the margin, it wasn't just that she actually painted her face. <laughs> the margin says, uh, put her eye in, I think it's painting, I can't read, I need glasses like Pip. Um, well, the Hebrew means she set her eyes in paint. You're thinking, that's really weird. It was actually to make them a little bit large. I've got a photograph there. So I, I went on a, a sideline on this because it sort of intrigued me what she was doing. So apparently she used a, a chemical substance called antimony, or the, the chemical substance now is called stibnite. And it's used by ancient Egyptians as an eye cosmetic owing to its rich black colour. I'm sort of thinking she could have just asked Elijah. I'm pretty sure he would have given her a couple of black eyes. But anyway, she used this special colouring to make her eyes black. Apparently it's poisonous if you inhale it. If you eat it, it's carcinogenic. And then I went off on a slight distraction, which I thought was very interesting. So this substance had a medicinal effect back through the Middle Ages. So it was used for eye makeup, and it was also used for skin med uh, medication. And also, you'll be interested in this, it was a widespread, widespread practice for pellets of stibnite to be swallowed to induce vomiting and as a laxative. This was in tune with the medical belief of the times that bad humours needed to be expelled from the body. Not tumours, humours. So I'm, I'm thinking if you were grumpy, you need to take a few of these pellets. I don't know, that's the medicinal, the scientific advice at the time. And then it went on, it was an expensive metal, and so the pellets were often retrieved for reuse and even passed from generation to generation. So that's the ultimate in recycling. <laughs> But getting back to the eye shadow, um, uh, another little historical comment says the Persians differ as much from us in their notions of beauty as they do, do in taste. So what it's saying is the Persians 
actually it's an appealing thing to have black eyes. Um, this writer who wrote back in the 1800s says, a large, soft and languishing black eye which then constitutes the perfection of beauty. It is chiefly on this account that the women use the power of antimony, which is this, which although it adds to the vi vivacity of the eye, it throws a kind of voluptuous languor over it, which makes it appear dissolving in bliss. <laughs> the Persian women have a curious custom of making their eyebrows meet. And if this charm be denied them, they paint their fo foreheads with a preparation made for that purpose. So apparently one eyebrow is very attractive to Persians. <laughs> well, anyway, here's Jezebel. I slightly detract. Here's Jezebel. She's painting her eyes to look very voluptuous. And the record goes on to say she tired, tired her head or adorned herself with a headdress. So she put on this tiara, she put on the royal crown, she put on the royal apparel. And her object was not to captivate Jehu, but to overawe and to intimidate him. Here she is, face to almost like eyeball to eyeball with Jehu. I'm going to take you down. So she, she put all this on. Now, you might like to jot this little quote against, you know, paint her face there in verse 30, uh, Jeremiah 4 and verse 30, because there's a reference there to it. We won't go. I'll cite it for you. Jeremiah 4, verse 30, it's, it's to the people of Israel who were, were really making overtures to the surrounding nations and rejecting God's worship. This, this is what the quote says. And you, O desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet that you adorn yourself in garments or ornaments of gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint. In vain you beautify yourself, your lovers despise you, they seek your life. So Israel was copying the practices of the world. This is really what God was saying. They were enlarging their eyes with paint. This is what Jezebel is doing here. So she was very fastidious to look good on the outside. Now, you look at that picture there. That's not Jezebel there. I'll show you Jezebel. I've actually got a, an original photograph of her. <laughs> that's, I think that's probably more like what Jezebel really looked like. Probably on the inside, more on the outside. But, of course, you know, this whole makeover that she's going to do is really going to be pointless because she's going to need a real workover after um, Jehu's finished with her for sure. Well, here's where she eyeballs Jehu as he comes in, and look what she says to him from the window, verse 31. As Jehu entered into the gate, she shouted out, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? Now, what's all this mean? Zimri. Um, you might like to jot 1 Kings 16, verse 15 in your margin there, because that's a reference back to Zimri, and this is the point. 44 years before... 44 years before, Zimri was a seven-day wonder. He was king for seven days. That's her point. So she's adorned herself. She looks like a queen. Jehu's coming in. She said, you know what? You're a seven-day wonder. So that would have been a little bit intimidating, I think, to Jehu. Um, the ESV actually puts it even more aggressively. The ESV says, and as Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it peace, you, Zimri, murderer of your master? She actually names him as Zimri. So again, he was a commander um, in Israel who rebelled against the king. He claimed the throne and he lost his life after seven days. She knew her history. She threatened and we might even say she bullied Jehu and said, You're just a seven-day wonder, mate. You're not going to last much longer than that. So here she is in great danger. She is hostile, she's arrogant, and she's insolent. That's the person that she was on the inside. And um, as we say, Zimri reigned all of one week until the word reached the army of Israel, and they chose Omri, who happened to be the father of Ahab. That was the whole dynasty now. So Zimri didn't last very long, and the aftermath of his challenge was this whole dynasty of Ahab, or Omri, Ahab and Jezebel. Well, verse 32, Jimri, uh, Jehu says, who is on my side? Well, you know, we know what happened. The narrative tells us nobody loved her, even her own um, eunuchs, her attendants uh, hated her. Uh, and he shouts out, uh, who is on my side? And I've just got to note, he probably would have been better to say, Exodus 32, verse 26, who is on Yahweh's side? All right? Remember, 
in the challenge with the golden calf, it was Moses who stepped forward and said, who's on the Lord's side? And the tribe of Levi stepped up uh, to defend right values. Anyway, he said, who's on, who's on my side? And um, she got thrown out of the window. And of course, there she is crashing to the ground. You'll note the reference says, in verse 33, he says, throw her down. So she got through, thrown down. And then it says... Some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall. I've got a little note that she fought all the way. It's not like, you know, she went easily. She would have scrabbled and fought with these uh, eunuchs and on the way down, you know, head smashed against the wall. She was, she was in a frenzy and um, eventually, of course, she crashed to the ground and it was a very ugly way to die, very, very violent, violent. And of course, then on top of that, it says at the end of verse 33, he trode her underfoot. So Jehu drove his horses over a corpse, um, his chariot just sort of right over the top of Jezebel. And it was just a, a horrible way to die, but Jehu was making sure that she died. There was nothing left to chance. It's like the arrow going through the heart. Jezebel fell down, he rode over her with a chariot because like, hey, we don't want her coming back to life, life again. So what a horrible way to die, very dishonourable way. Uh, she, she took time to make herself look good on the outside, but in the end, she wasn't good on the inside. And of course, the result was she lost, lost her life. And the record says there, in a, in a very bloodthirsty way, that there was blood splattered all over the place. It was on the wall, so if everybody saw it. Her body was broken as it hit the ground it was consumed by the dogs. And we, we, we sort of step back from that narrative and say, well, it can't get much worse than that. I mean, that's a horrible, horrible description, but it actually does get even worse. Because from the narrative there, nobody bothered to care for, for her. Nobody bothered to pick up the body. Jehu went in to eat. I mean, I guess it's probably been an exhausting day for him. <laughs> um, I don't know how he could eat after all that sort of thing happening. But um, he went in to, to eat, and of course, then someone gave him that information, you know, the body's still out there, what should we, we do? And uh, in verse 34, uh, he gives this command, go and see this cursed woman and bury it, for she's a king's daughter. Well, Jezebel did come from a very important lineage. She was the daughter of the king of Tyre. I don't know if you remember back when Ahab married her. She was a very significant person. She was the daughter of the king of Tyre. She was wife of Ahab, the king of Israel. She was the mother of Joram, the king of Israel, who just died as well. And um, she was the mother-in-law of the... Uh, or she was related to the king of Judah, and she was also the grandmother of Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So there's a whole family dynasty in there. Well... They sort of gave the information in verse 35 when they went out to bury her, uh, there, was, there was nothing left than her hands, her feet and her skull. So this, of course, is very symbolic of the type of person that she was. So even, and this is the point, even the dogs who were wild scavengers in the streets in those days, and they were capable of scavenging and eating the most disgusting offal that they could, they couldn't even digest her you know, skull, that's her thoughts, her feet, her walk, or her hands, her actions. And a couple of quotations about dogs eating their own vomit, Proverbs 26, 11, and 2 Peter 2, 22. Both those uh, writers make reference to the scavenger dogs who would actually eat their own vomit. But they couldn't, they couldn't stomach uh, these remains of Jezebel. So there's, you know, the lesson for us about our thoughts, our activity, our walk. And here are two great quotations really to put against verse 35 because this is really a characteristic of describing the way of life of people who completely reject God and do their own thing. It talks about their hands defiled with blood. I mean, you can read all that, mischief and lies and iniquity. The act of violence is in their hands, their feet run to evil, and their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. So there's the exact parallel there. And again in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 19, six things Yahweh hates, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that divides wicked imagination, 
and feet that are running to mischief. So again, there's that exact parallel to the, the whole approach of Jezebel. Opposite one, at least we, we, we do want to have a positive one because you know we don't want all this negativity to affect us and have nightmares tonight. <laughs> Psalm 24, verse 3 to 5. Who will ascend the hill of Yahweh? Who will stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who hasn't lifted up his soul to vanity or sworn deceitfully, he'll receive the blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That's, the gro- that's where we want to be, brothers and sisters, isn't it? We've got to divest ourselves of all those uh, corruptions that infiltrate into our mind, the influence of the world. We want to step apart from all of that and to be able to stand with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a horrible, a horrible end as far as Jezebel was concerned. She lived a despicable life. She murdered innocent people. In some senses, there's a justness to the way she died. But of course, there was nothing to bury. Um, you know, she was a great woman by her birth, by her connections, by her alliances, but her skeletal remains were just thrown into the field of Naboth. No tomb, no spe- special placard at all. Nothing to say, well, here lies Jezebel. And very appropriately, Proverbs 10, verse 7 says, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked rot. And that's going to be true in, in its final statement. When our Lord Jesus Christ returns, uh, he's going to resurrect the faithful, their memories, their characters, their personalities, what they thought about, what they did with their lives, because they're the people that he, he loves and he wants. Others like Jezebel, of course, will be forgotten and remembered no more. You know, this is the last reference to Jezebel in the Bible, apart from one, from one, one reference. You know, it's almost as though the Bible closes and, and she's, she, she's forgotten. But there's one last reference moving forward in the Bible, and surprisingly, it's in Revelation chapter 2 and verse... We won't go there. Revelation 2, verse 20 and 21. It's the only other reference to Jezebel. It's amazing. This is what it says. And I gave her space... Jezebel to repent of her fornication. I'm just going to pause on that little section here. I gave her, this is God talking, or Jesus Christ through John. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. You know, when we step back and think about that phrase, that's from the time period that Elijah says Jezebel's body will be thrown in a ditch and the dog will eat it. From the time that Elijah said that through the time of Jehu was 12 years. That was the space that God gave a woman like Jezebel to repent. Amazing. Amazing the the broadness of God's mercy and his love and his kindness, that even he would allow a space of time for a woman like Jezebel to change, make some different decisions. That's amazing. And I think that gives us a lot of encouragement because if God can be so gracious to a woman like Jezebel, then brothers and sisters, for you and me, his grace and his mercy is inestimable, wonderful, if we are going down the right pathway. So what do we take away from uh, tonight? <coughs> uh, four points. Jehu didn't hesitate to target and to use his full strength for God's service. What level of service are you comfortable with? Like we sort of get comfortable at a certain level because you know what? We look at what everyone else is doing and we sort of just adjust ourselves to that. But when we compare ourselves to Christ 24-7, a very short life, 33 and a half years of full service, then you know, maybe we, can, we need to lift our, our service, our level, our enthusiasm. Jehu remembered a conversation that he had you know, 15 years before and he waited patiently for the fulfilment of a prophecy. Are we ready to be involved in the new government to be established by Christ? So this is not a rest period for us that's awaiting us. It's a reinventing, a rejuvenation of the world itself. We want to be part of that. Will we have the energy and enthusiasm? Well, we'll be immortal, of course. But, you know, the mindset now is, are we ready to go? And when we go, will we give full strength? Well, we've got to do that now, of course, as a demonstration of our connection to Christ. Thirdly, are we discerning with our friendships or could they be leading us to disaster? Again, there's these two kings, Joram and Ahaziah. Disastrous friendship ended in their death. We have to be careful with where we go in our friendships. And finally, head, hands and feet. What have they been doing this last week? Will Christ want to preserve our thoughts, our activity and our direction as part of our godly character? They're the great lessons, practical lessons from the life of Jehu, which will continue in a couple of weeks.
previous sessions, we've had a look at the enthusiasm of Jehu, and a couple of weeks ago we looked at the, the section where he met up with uh, the kings in the portion of Naboth. And you might remember that it was almost providential and perhaps deliberate on the part of Jehu that he waited there in the uh, air of Naboth's vineyard because he wanted to fulfil a prophecy that had been given at least a decade before. So providentially in that very plot, he waited for these two kings and he exterminated them. And we noticed in our last session as well that, of course, he was full of vigour. He smote King Joram through the heart. Uh, he had a focus and a determination that was just quite incredible. And he began the purging of the nation. And of course, the exhortation to us is, are we like Jehu? Do we tolerate evil or do we actually hate it? Does, do we find it detestable? And of course, unfortunately, in today's world, 2022, uh, with all the information that we have at hand, the media, we perhaps make some adjustments where we are quite tolerant of, of things that are, are wrong. But certainly, like Jehu, in one way, we look to a new world and to a purging of this world and to the institution of the righteous principles of Jesus Christ. Well, we learned also that Jehu was reasonably acquainted with the, the prophecies of the scripture, with the words of Elijah. And of course, he brought them forward and he was going to fulfil them. So he wasn't just a military person who was out to embrace the throne and, and to present himself as the great king. He actually wanted to see the determination and the uh, fulfilment of God's purpose and his prophecy. And even when he came into the city of Jezreel, there was Jezebel who challenged him and said, look, you're only a seven day wonder. And of course, she was thrown down from the window and the woman that made Elijah quiver was nothing to Jehu. He just rode over her with the chariot and then went in and had a meal. So, you know, very, very cold hearted, we might think. And yet at the same time, he wanted to see a fulfillment of the purpose of God. So we've seen these two uh, sessions here, selection and the seriousness with which he conducted his mission a couple of weeks ago. Um, tonight, we want to have a look at his strategy. Now, where to from here? So that's, that's an important aspect. This is going to be the moving forward, the strategy now of Jehu, because, you know, with the, the leftovers of Jezebel cast out in a field, she was a prestigious and powerful woman. Jehu just sort of did not tolerate her and she was cast out in the field. You'd be thinking that's the end of the story. You'd be thinking, OK, that's done. The kings and the queen have been removed. And if the Bible record finished there and moved on, uh, we would think, well, Jehu accomplished what he needed to accomplish. But... Of course, he wanted to accomplish more than that, and his commission was to eradicate all the evil, all the wickedness of the house of Ahab, and there was still unfinished business. So he was very fastidious in making sure he fulfilled that prophecy to the letter. And while we think, well, Jehu's mission may have been quite simple and it was accomplished uh, fairly quickly, we'll notice now as we unravel his strategy that there was actually a lot more to his mission than just simply removing two kings and a queen. So this section tonight is going to open up some of the difficulties that Jehu encountered as he tried to eliminate and purge the nation. So we we'll already have a, a sort of an exhortation, I guess, a challenge to ourselves right at the beginning of this narrative because it's a bit like the elimination of sin in our own lives. On Sunday, it looks pretty simple. We come here on Sunday morning, we listen to the exhort, we take bread and wine, we think, OK, it's a new week, it's a good start, you know, I can do this. And of course, then by Monday and Tuesday, we find it a little bit more complicated. And by Friday and, and Saturday, we're actually frustrated with ourselves, we found it a little bit more difficult. So the elimination of sin, as far as Jehu was concerned, was not a simple matter. And it's not really a simple matter in our life either. It's not just over and done with quickly and easily. So we're going to come back to you know, this strategy that we have in our own lives of getting together on a Sunday morning. It is so important, revisiting and recommitting, because that's the only way we're going to at least move forward from the position of sinfulness. So as far as our background is concerned, we looked at Second Kings uh, chapter 9 last session. He's killed three people. He's killed Joram, Ahaziah and Jezebel. Now, we're not told of a large army that Jehu has at all. In fact, it wouldn't have been possible. So he hadn't garnered to himself some massive big army uh, to move through the, the whole Northern Territory and take control. It's really just himself and probably a handful of good men. The reason for that is, well, an army wouldn't be quick enough for Jehu. 
Remember, he's in his chariot, he heads down to Jezreel, he takes out the two kings and the queen. Well, to have a large massed army moving with him would have slowed down his progress. And of course, they had to stop back at Ramoth Gilead and protect the nation from the invading forces. So what's going to be Jehu's strategy now? Where to now? Is this the end of his mission? So, as I've said, one of his primary tasks would have been to execute any of the descendants, the sons of Joram, who, who will make a claim to the throne. He wanted to remove and eradicate the house of Ahab and all those descendants. Now, Joram was quite strategic himself as far as the king was concerned. We'll notice here in verse 1 of chapter 10, it says, Ahab, or the family or the dynasty of Ahab, had 70 sons in Samaria. So these are the descendants of Joram, uh, the king that he's just taken out. And there's 70 sons in this area of Samaria. So this is almost an impossible task when you think it from a strategic viewpoint. What's Jehu going to do now? He's got no army, he's got a handful of men. There's 70 sons or descendants dispersed throughout the city of Samaria and there's two problems here. One, Joram had placed his sons in Samaria, which was the most fortified city in the whole of that northern area. It was the capital of Israel. It was an easily defended city. So there's 70 sons inside that city, quite a formidable task. And secondly, Joram had particularly placed and scattered these 70 sons within that you know, village, that city area, because it says there unto the elders uh, and the rulers of Jezreel, to them that it brought up Ahab's children. So there was a whole, there was a number of families of people, of princes, of nobles, uh, amongst whom these 70 sons had been dispersed. So how on earth, even if, if Jehu comes into Samaria, how's he going to find out where all these sons, these descendants are? So... For Jehu, we might say, it looks like mission impossible. And when you think about that, um, 70 sons, you know, Joram was obviously quite a busy man, one would imagine. Um, here's a picture here, I counted them up, it's pretty, not quite close to 70. So I'm not quite sure whether he had 70 sons, um, which would be quite a task in itself, probably more male descendants, maybe even grandsons as well. In fact, Rehoboam holds, I believe, the biblical record, he had 88 sons and daughters, 28 sons and 60 daughters. So I would think that would be a nightmare as far as a family structure was concerned. But um, yeah, here, so Ahab, his descendants, his dynasty, there, there were 70 of them in all, sons, I guess, and, and grand grandsons as well. So immediately we've sort of got a, a problem and a challenge, and you'll see here, and I've got these coloured in in my Bible, because this is now the task for Jehu. He's taken out the two kings and the queen, but the prophecy of Elijah said the house of Ahab. And so now we see in the narrative all this scattered, uh, quite uh, uh, an involved process, a larger dynasty, a larger family, and Jehu has to el eliminate all of them. And of course, they all have the potential to continue the evil, wicked influence uh, throughout the nation of Israel. So you'll notice there, I've got a couple of, well, four quotations from the Psalms. David, of course, uh, felt this acutely as well, David being a king earlier who had established the throne in righteousness. But it's quite interesting to see, even from the life of David, how sensitised he was to the influence of evil about him. We would have thought David established the throne, everything's smooth, everything's controllable. But when you look at these quotations here, how are they increased that trouble me? Many they are. I consider mine enemies, for they are many. They're multiplied. There are many that fight against me. And of course, well, Jehu has at least 70 potential possibilities of people uh, rising again, challenging him for the throne, and his whole mission and work would have been undone very quickly. So he needs to take out the dynasty, the family of Ahab and Joram. How's he going to do that? Well, very interestingly, there's an echo of justice, and we're going to sort of unpack this a little bit tonight. Again, the more deeper we delve into the narrative, the more we find that Jehu was not just trying to claim the throne. He wasn't just a power-hungry person. He actually had a genuine and sincere desire to fulfil the prophecy that, and the commission that was imparted to him. So here we have this city of, of Samaria, and they're in a, in a very strong position because verse 2 talks about, with you are chariots and horses, a fenced city and armour, and he, he throws out a challenge in verse 3. 
he says, look, send that out and let's have a fight. So this is quite a bluff on the part of Jehu because, well, he didn't have an army. He had a handful of men and that was about all. You notice that he's only sent a letter there. He hasn't actually come down to Samaria himself. So the reasoning behind that, his strategy behind that, is that if the people of Samaria had seen the size of the, in quotes, army of Jehu, well, they might have laughed and they might have come out and just completely squashed this, this whole mission. So rather than him attend to Samaria, he sends a letter. And, of course, they were still in shock because the information had filtered through to them that two of the kings and the queen had been exterminated. So, you know, they, they, they listened to the rumours, the innuendo, whatever was circulating around about how powerful Jehu is. He's taken out a couple of kings and a queen. He must be powerful. His army must be with him. He's ready to have a big fight. What are we going to do? So Jehu's bluff worked, and that was his strategy. It wasn't going to be brute force. So, you know, stepping back a little bit, we might have imagined Jehu is just a man with a bow and arrow and he's going around killing everybody. So, no, there's more to the strategy of Jehu than just sort of brute force. He's thinking about his particular situation. So he sends out this message to Samaria and he still doesn't leave the area of Jezreel. So he's up in the area of Jezreel, the city of Jezreel, where he's taken uh, Jezebel and the other two kings out. So what's interesting is he sent uh, another letter, and this is sort of important. You'll notice in verse 6, it says he wrote a letter the second time. Now, there's a little bit behind the narrative here. And it's, it's a historical relevance really to what has occurred before with Naboth. So you notice there we've just got Jehu wrote letters and he's going to ask for the people of Samaria to exterminate these princes, these nobles, the dynasty of Ahab and put their heads in a basket. They'll happen to get the correct picture. There's the, one, of, one of the baskets there. No heads in it yet. <laughs> now here's the interesting thing worth colouring in. This word letter. He wrote letters. The letter comes to you. He wrote another letter. It came to pass. Now we think, what's, what's the big important thing about letters? This is a point of communication. Well, the thing is, he's playing out the incident that happened with Naboth and Jezebel. So right on the back of everything that he's doing is the justice of God for the innocency of Naboth and the losing of his life. So that's the whole background to where Jehu is going. Now, when you have a look at this, this is quite interesting because back in 1 Kings 21 verse 8, it's Jezebel who wrote, oh, letters. She sent letters, she wrote letters, and it was written in the letters. Four times duplicated there in the narrative here in 2 Kings chapter 10. So there's this interplay as far as Jehu is concerned where he's sort of revisiting history. It's not just, well, I'm going to come in and steamroll everyone out and I'll be king. It's, there's a sense of justice that the, the Queen Jezebel had sent letters and now he's sending letters as well. So there's this whole uh, interplay. And you'll notice as well, quite interesting, uh, it says in verse 1, Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria, right? And he sent to Samaria unto, and here comes this little phrase, the rulers of Jezreel. So these were possibly the nobles and the princes who were in Jezreel, which is the very town, the city, the village, in which Naboth lost his life. So it seems as though either they're relocated or, or possibly they moved between these two places. But his target is the rulers of the, of the city of Jezreel, which again underlines this whole outworking uh, of the sense of justice for uh, God and for, for Naboth as well. So he doesn't give much time for the people in Samaria. So you'll notice as well, he sends another letter and he says in verse 6 and 7, look, if you want to capitulate, if you want to surrender, that's fine. I'm OK with that. And that's what happened to the people of Samaria. They sent this note saying, we don't want to fight. You know, obviously, you've got a very powerful force. We surrender. So now he sends a second letter and he says in verse 7, well, you know, You've got a very short period of time and you need to uh, exterminate these 70 sons, put their heads in, in, a, in a basket or a number of baskets, obviously. I'm sure 70 heads wouldn't fit in one basket. <laughs> so a number of baskets and um, send, them, send them to me. So he gives them a deadline in verse 6, like 
you're not going to take two years to do this. You're not going to take six months. You're not even going to take a week. You have 24 hours. So you notice that particularly in verse 6. He says, uh, take the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. So these men, you know, the messengers, they're going to have to act with rapidity. Uh, because they, they haven't got time. It's about 25 k's from Jezreel down to Samaria and back again. So, you know, 50 k journey, they've been up and down twice. So it's going to already take a big segment of time. They've only got 24 hours to get 70 heads in, in 70 baskets and back to Jezreel. So it's going to take a reasonable time. But I just, you know, I'm interested in that little phrase, by tomorrow this time, because again... Uh, you know, it's a revisit of history. It's quite amazing, these threads that keep crisscrossing back to this whole um, scenario with Jezebel, King Ahab and Naboth. And again, uh, here's this little phrase. It's back in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 2. It's the threat that Jezebel made to Elijah. And, and, and Jehu, in some sense, is revisiting that and he's bringing back that phrase into play. Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them in 24 hours. So here's that, uh, that, that revisit again by tomorrow this time. So Jehu is executing justice on all those threats that Jezebel and Ahab made. And it's interesting to follow this little phrase through scripture as well because um, embedded in that phrase is the aspect that God is in control. And the thing, thing about our lives, and often when we look at the scriptures, we tend to think that God acts very slow. Or, you know, we look at the life of Moses, who was, you know, 40 years in the wilderness, uh, and some of the others that, that had a long period of time before change came. And we often sort of say, well, you know, sometimes God takes a lifetime to, to work in our lives before things change. Not always. You know, in the life of Hezekiah, things change very, very quickly. Isaiah the prophet came in and of course the healing of his terminal illness uh, was going to occur and three days he was going to go up to the temple, uh, the Assyrian army was destroyed. So, you know, God in his particular program or schedule ha has his own timeline and whether that's 24 hours or whether it's a few years, uh, that's up to God's providence. So here, um, Jehu has, has brought forward again the threat of Jezebel and now he's applied it back to the nobles and princes of Samaria. So, sort of, it's bounced back. But here's this particular phrase, by tomorrow this time. It was, it's God's promise that calmed Moses. When he was down in Egypt, the plagues were going on. Pharaoh had his heart hardened. Um, the people of Israel were saying to Moses, well, I don't know, you know who you are, but things have got worse when you came back. What's all this deliverance? When's the exodus going to happen? So, God says, behold, tomorrow about this time, I'll cause it to rain. So, within 24 hours, and that would have given comfort to Moses... And, and given weight to his leadership. Again, God's protection, he calms Joshua. Be not afraid of them for tomorrow about this time, I'll deliver them up slain. So Joshua just didn't wander into the land of Israel and all his enemies fell down before him. There was some apprehension as far as Joshua was concerned. He had to have a, a strategy himself. But here comes the comfort of God within 24 hours, you know, I'll allow you to move through this particular area. Again, Samuel was concerned the people of Israel were agitated. We want a king, we want a king. You're not good enough, Samuel. And Samuel feels very deficient and very disappointed uh, with the people of Israel. Well, a message comes within 24 hours, I will solve this problem. So here again in Samuel, tomorrow about this time I'll send your man out of Benjamin to be captain. Well, that was Saul. And again, here uh, challenging King Joram uh, in 2 Kings 7. You remember this particular situation or the story. They're under siege. The people in Samaria, this is exactly the same town, so they've heard this phrase before. It's only a, a few chapters back. Uh, they're under siege and, you know, desperate times. They were sort of eating whatever things they could find. And Elisha comes to the prophecy and says, within 24 hours, this will be all over. And you might remember, says, a lord on whose hand the king leaned and answered, oh, What's going what's to open heaven, the windows in heaven and rain food on us? You know, he said this is an impossibility. And the outworking of that story, of course, was this uh, Lord was trampled upon um, when the message came through that the army that was 
creating the siege had all been destroyed. Remember those leprous men went out and brought that message back and he got trampled as people rushed out to grab you know, whatever they could. So, yes, um, I think it's quite lovely that God can work very quickly in our lives. Sometimes within a very short period of time, he can flip our lives and you know, we, we have a new situation that uh, we can work through. And again, James picks that up in the New Testament. He says, you know, what, what's it going to be like tomorrow within 24 hours? Watch your life. It's like a vapour. It appears for a little time. It vanishes away. You ought to say, God willing. And I guess through COVID times, maybe we've been a little bit more aware of how quickly our world can change. In the last two years, 2019, 2020, 2021, we've seen how rapid the world can change. And of course, God is in control. And one day there will be a 24-hour period when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and this world will be eventually completely changed. So we come to verse 7 and um, the record there says they acquiesced to Jehu's command and they took the king's sons and put their heads in, uh, a bas in baskets. Now, I think, again, highlighting this word basket is particularly important. One writer said this, he said, this was a suitable response to Ahab's sin. He had discarded the baskets of grapes out of Naboth's vineyard at Jezebel, and now the heads of his sons are brought thither in baskets. So again, you know, constant overtones to this whole situation that happened with, with Naboth and with Ahab. And now Jehu says, well, I want those heads, and not just in the back of a cart, I want them in baskets. So again, there's almost this overtone of the situation that occurred back with Naboth. Now, it's, it's, it's a horrible circumstance. We could imagine in verse 8, he says, put them out in two heaps. So, you know, you've got 36 bleeding heads on one side and 36 bleeding heads on the, outside the gate of Jezreel. It'd be pretty confronting. Like the people get up in the morning, you know, it's a new day, sun's coming up, birds are chirping and they head out to the city and there on either side, you know, is this mountain of heads. <laughs> Quite... Uh, Gross, And we sort of think, why was Jehu doing this? I mean, obviously, here in the narrative, he's got to be a bloodthirsty man. Well, not necessarily. Again, one historical commentator says it was a, customary, it was a contemporary custom throughout the ancient East to pile up the heads of captured rebels by the main city gate as a public warning against rebellion. So this is sort of a, a cultural thing uh, just to, to impart a message. And obviously, it was quite a visual message. But Jehu addresses the people of Jezreel in verse 9. And there's a bit of a, a convoluted phrase here, because I, I read this and I thought, what, what is he trying to say? So verse 9 says, It came to pass in the morning that he went out and he stood, and he said to all the people, You be righteous, behold, I conspired against my master and slew him, but who slew all these? Now, what, what, what does this mean? Well, what he was saying is the pe he's not going to hold the people of Jezreel guilty of this uh, particular execution. He says, you're just, and therefore you need to judge this situation justly. And then he says, but who slew all these? And there's sort of like uh, an eloquent profession of feigned astonishment. He's like, uh, and so he's not just a military person who is not very eloquent. He's, he's quite good in the way he dresses. The he gathers the people of the city and he said, well, who slew all these? It's quite a dramatic moment. And what he explains is that it was because of Yahweh's commission. This is Yahweh's doing. This isn't something that he's just initiated because he wants to sit on the throne. And so we've got this, um, again, this verse, which would have coloured previously in, but I want to emphasise again, verse 10, Jehu doesn't stand there and say, well, you know, in all my prestigiousness and my might and my power, this is what I've done. No, not at all. What does he say, verse 10? Uh, who slew all these? Well, it's God's providence. Verse 10, know now that there shall uh, fall unto the earth nothing of, here it comes, the word of Yahweh, which Yahweh spake concerning the house of Ahab, for Yahweh hath done this which he spoke. So again, hopefully, if you're at a previous session, you've got the same words coloured in because that's where he received his commission. It's from God. And here he repeats that again four times 
So that message is, is very clear. God has brought this situation to pass. Therefore, these people, he's not going to hold them accountable or to, to blame. Now, the other thing which is interesting there in that particular verse, in verse 10, he uses, a, again, another phrase we might have heard of before. Beginning of verse 10, he says, Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of God. Now, you know where he's quoting that from. It's from the early years of Samuel. In 1 Samuel 3, verse 19, we won't go there, but 1 Samuel 3, verse 19 says this, Samuel grew and Yahweh was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. It's exactly the same phrase. And he, again, this is Jehu, he brings forward the, the words of Scripture, as it were, that particular phrase, none of the words of Samuel fell to the ground because... Yahweh was with him. And so that's what Jehu is implying in his own activity. He's saying, I'm, you know, I just didn't step forward because I want the throne. I'm actually fulfilling the words of Yahweh and none of this prophecy will fall to the ground. So the context, of course, back in Samuel is what? The evil and the wickedness of the dynasty in the house of Eli and his sons, which God said, well, I'm going to wipe them out. And so now there's a parallel situation and Jehu is saying, well, just back in the days of Samuel, the dynasty of e Eli was wiped out because of his wickedness. None of those words fell to the ground. Here's my situation and I'm fulfilling the word of God and I'm taking out the dynasty of Ahab, which likewise is, is wicked and evil. So he's paralleling that uh, as well. So what we're learning is, I think we're learning, is that Jehu wasn't uneducated when it came to, we might say, Bible matters or, or, or the history of Israel. And he says it's like a, an arrow that's going to be fired. This, this whole phrase, fall to the ground, what does that mean? Well, it means like if you fire an arrow and it doesn't hit the target, it just sort of drifts up into the air and you just sort of dive down into the ground. What a wasted arrow that was. So Jehu is saying, yeah, none of my arrows are wasted. When I, when I uh, focus on my target, the arrow doesn't dive to the ground, it goes to the target. That's the, the meaning of that particular phrase. So Jehu is offering a reminder that all these things that are happening and occurring are because of the command of God. And this is uh, where the nation now need, needs to move forward with Jehu. And so the people of Jezreel find Jehu's arguments compelling, of course. And so you know, Jehu is now going to launch further into exterminating there in Jezreel anyone who's connected with the house of Ahab or with Jezebel. So we notice in verse 11, um, and I've got the word all and the word and coloured in because this is where Jehu progresses. So verse 11 says, So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all the, his, great, his, his great men and his kinfolks and his priests until he left nothing remaining. So Jehu is going to carry out very clearly, the full extent of the commission that was given to him. Now, I wonder, brothers and sisters, whether, you know, that's where we sit. Remember at our baptism, we gave a full commitment to God that we would walk the straight and narrow, there wouldn't be any deviation. Uh, we came out of the wars of baptism, it was a new life for us. We were sure that Jesus was just, you know, around the corner, maybe a couple of years away, so it wouldn't be a, a long walk for us, or, and we were going to be faithful and we were going to be committed. But when we think about our lives, there's been a lot of turns, hasn't there? Sometimes maybe even circles. Maybe we've gone around in circles. So, you know, we, we haven't perhaps been um, complete in trying seriously to focus on the target, the kingdom, where we want to go, and pursuing that relentlessly. It's been distractions. But when we look at the life of Jehu, there is a, there is a positive example up to this point where he had that focus and where he completed it fully. He didn't just let it go with, well, there's two kings and a Jezebel. That should be good enough. He went the, the, the full length of his commission. So that's in verse 10, that heavy emphasis. And even uh, that little phrase at the end of verse 11, you'll notice that there's a phrase there that's um, cross-referenced in the margin. Uh, it says, he left him none remaining at the end of verse 11. If you've got the King James, uh, there's a little notation to Joshua chapter 10, verse 28. It's exactly the same phrase. When Joshua came in and it says... He left none remaining. Joshua 10, 28. It was the destruction on that particular occasion of the Canaanites. 
who again, what, why was Joshua exterminating the Canaanites? Because they had evil and wicked practices. So again, Jehu is corresponding, the work that he was doing was the extermination of wickedness and evil and he almost harkens back to the phraseology of Joshua. He said, well, I'm doing nothing different than what Joshua did when he came to exterminate uh, the Canaanites. So we might step back and we might say, well, I don't know, verse 11, I think Jehu's going a little bit too far. He's taken out two kings, a queen, um, you know, and, and 70 of the descendants... Surely that's enough. Isn't he going a little bit too far? Well, let's remember that some of these people here mentioned in verse 11, uh, these nobles and certainly the priests uh, were involved in a trial of mockery when it came to innocent Naboth. Just an innocent man trying to protect his inheritance with his sons, with his families, with his family and he was removed at the instigation of these people in verse 11, the rulers, the nobles, the princes, and possibly the, the priests as well. So you remember back in 1 Kings 21 verse 8, the record says, um, Jezebel sent the letters unto the elders and the nobles that were in his city and that dwelt at Naboth, or with Naboth, there in Jezreel. Uh, it says in verse 11, and the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles, who dwelt in his city, city of um, Jezreel, did as Jezebel had sent to them. So these people that, Jezebel, that Jehu now takes out were implicitly involved in the murder of Naboth and his sons. So they weren't innocent bystanders, and obviously the priests, well, the priests of Jezebel were known for their, their wicked and evil behaviour. And of course, earlier, Elijah challenged them on Mount Carmel. So up to this point, Jehu has done a fairly thorough job of cleansing the northern territory of the evil and wickedness in the ruling house, the influential house of the king and the queen. Well, so we read on what happens next. Well, verse 13, uh, this is now a, an interesting point in the life of Jehu and where he's going to go as far as his strategy is concerned. It says there, Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So these are relatives that are coming up from Judah now to visit the king, king and the queen because they were connected by family. But there's a little point here I want to make. They're actually not the, the brothers of Ahaziah because his family was wiped out. So it's the relatives, more an extended family. So I don't know if you want to put it in your margin, but either way... Um, here we're, we're going to just go historically to 2 Chronicles 21, verse 17. Uh, they're invaded by, tro uh, by the army from foreigners, foreign soldiers from the east. It says, They came into Judah and they broke it up and carried away all the substance that was found in the king's house and they carried away his sons also and his wives. And here's the point. So that there was never a son left to him save Jehoahaz, also called Ahaziah. This is the one that Jehu took out the youngest of his sons. So Ahaziah was sitting on the throne. He was the youngest because all his brothers had been exterminated. So when he was taken out, sort of that was the end of the, the line. Second Chronicles 22 verse 1, just a chapter on, says, The inhabitants of Jerusalem made, here he is, Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his stead, stead for the band of men that came with the Arabians had slain all the eldest. Um, and so they made him king. And here's a little interesting point, next verse. 22 years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. Here it is. His mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri. So this is now just trying to join all these pieces together. We're wondering, I guess, in verse 12, why these extended relatives are travelling up north to, to catch up with King Ahaziah and King Joram. Hadn't they heard the news of what had gone on? Why would they be travelling from Jerusalem all the way up through to Samaria? Well, what we have to realise is only a few days have passed. Uh, you know, there's a 24-hour period. Jehu is moving with quite um, increased speed. It's not like this took a week or a month or a year. And obviously, you know, no emails, no SMSs, no mobile phones in those days. So here's these relatives. They set out on a journey and their paths crossed. So they were unaware of the onslaught that had occurred up in the northern area. 
But here, I think, is where we see Jehu taking a, a divergence from the original commission simply to take out the family of Ahab because now Jehu is going too far. He's now going to take out, he's now going to dabble into the southern ki kingdom and people that were coming up from Judah. And that was never his commission. God didn't commission him to take all of the north and all of the south, everyone in, well, not everyone, but you know, all the ruling people, the influence people, influential people in Israel and Judah, take them all out. No, that wasn't his commission. He was consigned to the north, to Ahab and to those relatives up there. Now he's dabbling into Judah. And so he's become a little bit reckless and he's starting to dabble into the affairs of Judah. And the sorry thing is, and you can pick it up from this record here in verse 2, um, when he took out sort of Ahaziah and, of course, then the relatives, guess who stepped into the vacuum? Well, it was Athaliah. And the reason this now is the divergent point of Jehu is because it's recorded significantly in Chronicles. So I want you to come across to 2 Chronicles 22 because the history of the book of Chronicles generally uh, crosses between uh, Judah and the northern tribes in Israel. It gives us a bit of the history, joins the chronology together, talks about you know, the kings that were down in the south and the kings that were up in the north. But now there's going to be a marked change. So when we come to 2 Chronicles 22 and verse 8, the chronologer makes a particular reference to this situation with Jehu. So verse 7 says the destruction of Ahab was of God by coming to Joram. Um, you know, he, he was up there in the north and Jehu took him out. Verse 8, it came to pass when Jehu was executing judgment upon the house of Ahab and he found princes of Judah and the sons of the brethren of Ahaziah that he that ministered to Ahaziah, he slew them. Uh, verse 9 sort of carries on a little bit as well. This is the situation we're looking at tonight right now. But look at verse 10. Because what Jehu initiated was a terrible catastrophe down in Judah. It was incredible upheaval now uh, down in the south because verse 10 says... When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw her son was dead, she, um, she killed all her grand grandsons, her grandchildren, took them all out. So now, in a sense, because Jehu has dabbled down with things in, in Judah, this now leads to a vacuum, of course. Uh, there are no relatives that can step into the, the area of the throne. So Athaliah takes it upon herself to kill all her grandsons and fill that vacuum. So there's a massive ripple effect now that's happening way down south as well as, of course, um, north. So if we turn over the pages, what's, you know, just turn over the pages, you'll notice that it's all about Judah. Joash repaireth the temple, you turn a page, uh, it's uh, Amaziah, this is a different Amaziah, he's reigning in Jerusalem, saying the Edomites. You will look in vain for any reference now to the northern tribes. You get to chapter 27, well, it's Jotham, and then Ahaz, you get to chapter 29 and 30, it's all about Hezekiah. Uh, you know, you keep turning your page, looking, there's got to be something about Israel in here now. No, you get to chapter 34, it's all, you know, it's Josiah, Josiah's Passover, and before you know it, you finish the book of Chronicles. So significantly, in the book of Chronicles, this is the, the, the cut-off point where there's no more record of anything that happens down in Judah because, well, Athaliah took control uh, because Jehu dabbled a little bit too far in what was going on down in the south. So, you know, this, I think, is the turning point. Up to now, I think I would be accepting that the Jehu was taking out the commission that he'd been instructed with and, and anointed with to fulfil the decimation of the house of Ahab in the north. Now he started to dabble a little bit too far. And I think there's a, a when we come back now to Second of Kings chapter 10, there's a, a particular geographical point that will have, I think, quite a lesson for us. So coming back to Second of Kings 10 and verse 13, uh, Jehu meets these uh, brethren from down Judah, and they're moving up to the north, of course. And he says, well, who, who are you? And they say in verse 13, well, we're the brothers of King Ahaziah. We've come down to recognise and salute the king and the queen. Verse 14 is quite brutal. It says, take them alive. They took them and slew them at the pit of the shearing house 
42 men, neither was left alive any of them. Now, there's a, there's a little geographic marker point in verse 12. You'll notice it says, and you think, why, why is this overemphasised? It says in verse 12, and as he was at the shearing house, and again, it says it in verse 14, he slew them at the pit of the shearing house. What's this all about? Well, some translations say he slaughtered them into the cistern of Beth Eked. It actually puts it as a proper name, a, a village, Beth Eked. It says he slew them or slaughtered them into the cistern of Beth Eked. So a cistern is like a well. So what it's saying is that uh, he was so brutal, he basically got these 42 men and either cut their throats over the cistern and then dumped their bodies in there. So, well, that's a bit confronting. So, you know, another 42 just out of the way. But very interesting, uh, the, the Hebrew in this particular se section. So you'll notice here, I've emphasised verse 12, verse 14, when he was at Beth Eked of the shepherds. This is, uh, I think it's the ESV or similar, at the pit of Beth Eked. Now what the Hebrew word of this phrase means is the house of the binding or the gathering of the shepherds. So this geographical marker is inserted for a point. It's a place where shepherds came and they used to converse together and they prepared the sheep for shearing. They'd bound the legs and they would shear the sheep. They'd all be there together, they would converse. And this is the point where Jehu really now should have become a shepherd. I think this is what the narrative is saying. He's, he's removed all the bad influence. He now should have become a shepherd and instead he'd sort of bound these 42 men and slit their throats. These were the princes of Judah. That was never his commission. He'd gone beyond the border uh, and now he's taking a different direction. So I think this is the transitioning point that led him and I think now, it's not our subject this week, it will be next week, in verse 15 we'll go, he'll meet Jonadab and I think that was providential by God um, to say, look, here's Jonadab, he's a good man. Jehu, you need to become more like Jonadab. But it sort of worked the other way. We'll unpack that next week. So Jonadab is a Rechabite. He's a good and he's a godly man. And one would hope that conversation would have helped to redirect, redirect Jehu, but it didn't. So there was a particular uh, turning point. And it's here at this geographical location which says the house of the binding or the gathering of the shepherds. Jehu needed to become a shepherd from here on. There's enough blood, there was enough uh, decimation. And of course, uh, that's an important part of leadership and we see that whole dimension missing from Jehu. Um, here, of course, Isaiah 40 says, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. This is part of leadership. It's not just removing evil. And again, in our own lives, we, we see that in the bread and the wine, don't we, on a Sunday morning, the two elements. Yes, we've got to remove evil. We've got to crucify the flesh. That's true enough. But then we've got to fill that with, with the wine of, of rejoicing and love and positivity. So that, that balance has to be seen in our lives. And it wasn't seen in the life of Jehu. He was just a machine that decimated people and there was just a vacuum there. Again, Ezekiel 34 says, as a shepherd seeks out his flock, well, that's what Jehu should have been doing, giving direction there and focus. Um, in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, and that's exactly what had happened to Israel. As Jehu rolled through, you know, the whole nation was stepping back because, wow, you know, they were gasping for air. They didn't know what had happened. And now he needed to fill that with positivity. Uh, so will I seek my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And of course this moves through to a prophecy. I'll set up one shepherd over them. He will feed them. Even my servant, the beloved David, Jesus Christ, he will feed them and be their shepherd. This is where Jehu at this point needed to become a shepherd. And beautiful quote in Matthew 9.36, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, says he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion because they fainted and were scattered as sheep having no shepherd. That's where the people of Israel were right at this moment. They were scattered, they had no, there was no direction. Two kings, a queen to be taken out, the dynasty, the household of Ahab, 70 people, uh, where to now? And Jehu didn't fill that particular gap. So this is where we are at this point. As I say, two kings killed, Queen Jezebel has been left for the dogs to eat, 70 descendants of Ahab, uh, 42 princes have been thrown into a cistern, unnumbered priests and noblemen wiped out. It was just a terrible time for Israel. It was brutal, 
It was initially purposed, of course, because Jehu wanted to cleanse out Israel, but he didn't now follow through with that shepherding process of leadership. We've got to give a tick to Jehu because, notably, he is the only king in the Northern Territory who ever rolled back on wicked behaviour. That's got to be significant. All the other kings, all the north, kings in the north in Israel were all wicked kings and they promoted wickedness. Jehu is the only one who rolled that back. So, you know, I, I guess we can give him half a tick. And he's the only king in the record, across the page in chapter, at the end of chapter 10, that says he did that which was right before God. So he has got the commendation of God, you know, proportionally. But we'll see in our future sessions there was no turning towards God no incentive for the people to worship God correctly. And this is where the failing comes. So what, about, what are our takeaways tonight that you know, we can apply personally to ourselves? Jehu did not leave his commission half done with just the death of the main rulers. Could have been the end of the story last week, I guess. He continued relentlessly to pursue any connection to sin. What about ourselves? How focused and fastidious are we with the little things we do wrong? We gloss over, well, they're not important. You know, does it really matter? That wasn't the approach of Jehu. We want to remove every, every little element of wickedness and sin. I wonder how, whether we have that commission in our own lives. Jehu acted fast to eliminate any resistance. 24 hours, you've got 24 hours to get these 70 heads in 70 baskets. Do we procrastinate or fumble or rationalise our problems. Again, we say, you know, oh, well, I'll fix that. Look, I'm just going through a really bad period in life. Um, you know, hopefully another 10 years when I'm a bit more mature, I'll, I'll be able to deal with that. So we sort of procrastinate and put things off a bit. He let none of God's word fall to the ground. How diligent have we been in reading God's word this week? You know, we look at all these examples and there he is. He, he, he was going to faithfully carry his commission. We all did that when we came out of the waters of baptism. We said we'd be faithful. You know, have we been opening the word or have we just sort of, well, you know, is it that, that important? Can we balance both the elements of eradication and shepherding in our lives, the truth and love blend? And this is where, of course, Jehu has now gone wrong. He's got the eradication in place, that's fine, but he doesn't blend it, of course, with, with, with the love and with the devotion and with the joy of the truth. So, brothers and sisters, that's the challenge to us. And next week, God willing, we'll move on to this great example of Jonadab, the son of Recap. a world in disarray where they're facing a lot of uh, disturbing problems, whether that's <coughs> political or as far as climate is concerned. Um, the world certainly is struggling to find positive direction forward. And it really wasn't much different in the times, of course, of Jehu. The nation was quite, quite chaotic and uh, people were trying to find direction forward. And it was supposed to happen, of course, under the leadership of King Jehu. And we're going to unpack tonight further events that happened uh, as he tried to restabilise the northern area of Israel. So we've had a look at, in our previous se sessions of selection, uh, the anointing of Jehu for this particular event. We've looked at his seriousness. Uh, he didn't sort of delay. He didn't shrug his shoulders and say too hard or, you know, I can't do this task. He, he focused on it particularly. Uh, last study, we saw his strategy. And tonight, we want to have a look at this whole process of separation. Uh, and how, in his particular perspective, that sort of needed to happen. So previously, as we've said, uh, Jehu had this commission to eradicate the dynasty of Ahab, and we saw the death of two kings plus a queen, um, and Jehu, of course, continues on this eradication process. And with some justice, of course, the elders, the nobles, the princes in the area of Jezreel were also exterminated because of their murder of innocent Naboth. So there was a sense of justice as Jehu continued to carry that through. And we would have noticed in our last session, if you remember it, of course, that little emphasis on the word letters. Uh, earlier in chapter 10 here, hopefully you've got it coloured in, letters were going backwards and forward. And of course, that had an echo back to the letters that uh, Jezebel sent through to the 
elders there in Naboth, in Naboth's territory in Jezreel, uh, to uh, take Naboth and destroy him. So there's, there was some justice and sort of echoes certainly back from that particular event. However, we noticed the divergence, and I think there was a point last week where we saw he was in the shepherd's house there in verse uh, 12 and 13, and uh, verse 14 particularly, where perhaps Jehu now had to take leadership in a more positive role. And of course, the shepherding aspect was particularly important introduced in the narrative there. Not only was he there to execute justice, but he's also to show now, well, should have shown, a shepherding role to the nation and directed them in a positive way to the worship of God. But he had an obsession, of course, with violence. We'll see that more as this unravels tonight. And of course, in our previous session, there were some visitors coming up from Judah to uh, give their regards to king, the king, King Joram. But of course, he took them out as well, which left a horrible vacuum down south in uh, the area of Judah, which the terrible, horrible Queen Athaliah then slew all her grandsons and she went onto the throne. So the, the repercussions were really quite horrific. And of course, those 42 men were, were slain there by the cistern of Beth Eked. Well, you know, the, the story doesn't end there. And if you, you know, haven't had enough violence, well, there's going to be a little bit more tonight because that's what Jehu uh, determined to do with anyone who was not worshipping the God of Israel. So he now wanted to eradicate um, the, the complete worship of Baal. And his process was, of course, uh, to, to take as many people as he could to destroy them and to break down the temple. Uh, and that would then leave perhaps an opportunity for, for worship to begin. And he was quite violent in the way that he did that. So this, in a, in a way, was a divergence as far as Jehu was concerned because now he was actually eradicating the political infrastructure of the nation. He's basically wiping out all the, the ruling people, the princes and nobles, right through Samaria, right through that whole northern area. And of course, that was also to destabilise anyone who may make a charge for the throne. So he's just you know, wiping as many people out as he could, both religious and in some senses non-religious as well. So this is the problem tonight, is that Jehu didn't stop his slaughter, he didn't give people an opportunity for repentance. And I think that's probably the underlining state that we need to make tonight. He just slaughtered people, if they're all there in the house of Baal, he killed a lot of them. So there was no opportunity for repentance at all. And this is going to be picked up in our final study and also in the prophecy of Hosea. So we can't deny that Jehu had an intense zeal for God and for the things of God. That's a, a given. But what he was deficient in was displaying the righteousness of God. That is the right living the ways of God. And for Jehu, I won't say it's an easy task, but his, his simple focus was just destroy anything that opposes God. And we know in our own lives, well, yes, that's part of the equation. That's part of our life. We've got to resist evil. But that's not the end story. We've got to replace that, of course, with, with worship, praise, honour, thankfulness, all the positive elements of why we love God. So there's a balance there that is needed. So in our session tonight, which begins, of course, in verse 15, we've got Jehu in his chariot again. I'm sort of amazed uh, how often Jehu, he seems to love this chariot and he's there in his chariot again. Uh, verse 15 says, when he was departed thence, he lied on Jonadab and invited him into his chariot. So there he is again in his chariot. He's coming down to Samaria. He's not on his own this time. He's got Je Jehonadab or Jonadab, the son of Rechab, with him. And I think, again, this is another little instant, instance where Jehu could have had a, a, a profitable conversation with Jonadab, who was a very faithful and godly man, and that might have helped to write Jehu's direction. Jonadab, as we'll see, uh, we'll unpack it a little bit tonight, was a very conservative brother, we might say, or, or man, uh, who had a, a very definite viewpoint of right worship of God. And uh, there was this conversation, this connection with Jehu. Now, we'll notice here in verse 15, and there's an important point here, in this first sentence, or the first couple of phrases, verse 15, it says, when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. Now, I'm just going to stop on that word lighted because we sort of tend to think, well, you know, he just happened to be there and I, I guess, you know, that he just invited him in his chariot. It was all sort of pretty random. But if you look at the margin, you'll notice it's the Hebrew word found. 
So it almost indicates that there was a previous connection, or at least a knowledge, of Jehonadab. So this is uh, helpful for us as far as Jehu is concerned. He wasn't just a military person who was sort of in his chariot destroying everybody. He actually had contact points and people that he knew. And one of them was Jonadab. I'm going to say Jonadab, not Jehonadab, although I know that's in the record there in verse 15, but he's also called Jonadab um, in Jeremiah. And because I can say it short, I can pack more into my talk. <laughs> so anyway, he found, he found him there uh, in that verse uh, 15. And it's the same word met that we referred to back in chapter 9 and verse 21. Remember we said, I think it was our first study or maybe the second, that Jehu met King Joram and Ahaziah in the area of Naboth's vineyard. And it wasn't just a chance meeting. He actually was wait, waiting there for them. And that's where... Uh, the execution happened and, and justice was meted out. So he found him um, and they met there in this particular area of the shepherd house. And again, I think that's very important, that the narrative we talked about last week, uh, this house of the shepherds, this is the place where um, John Adab was. He was probably known as a point of, of connection because John Adab came from a nomadic tribe, the Kenites. We're going to unpack this a little bit more tonight as to their very interesting background. The Kenites were a nomadic group. Uh, they didn't have any uh, central place where they, they dwelt. There was no city. In fact, that was the instruction that they should be nomads, wanderers, strangers, and they were shepherds as well. So perhaps, and it would seem very possible here that the Kenites were gathering, you know, either to shear the sheep or perhaps to water the sheep, and this is where they, they connected. And so this, this shows really that deeper connection that Jehu had uh, as we said, beyond military matters, he understood, he knew the reputation, he knew the reputation of John Adab, and he searched him, he met him, he found him, he invited him to the chariot. So there's a very strong connecting point to the influence, and we might even say the expertise of John Adab that he was connecting to and inviting to be part of this movement. So John Adab was a man of remarkable strength and fortitude, he instructed his family, and those instructions carried on for another 250 years. So he wasn't the sort of person who was just about exterminating and, and had a negative view of the truth. He instructed his family, and for another 250 years and beyond, because it's 250 years um, to, the, to the time of Jeremiah, um, he, he was a very positive person as far as the truth was concerned and the following generations. So the question is, as we look at the narrative here in verse 15, uh, about halfway through verse 15, a very probing question. Jehu says, is your heart right as my heart is with your heart? Is your heart right? Now, I guess on the background of that, there's the essence of pride perhaps a little bit of self-presumption, maybe even arrogance, we could say, because here's Jehu, he's, he's slaughtering, he's wiping out people left, right and centre, he thinks he's doing the will of God, and he, and he turns to uh, Jehonadab, or Jonadab, and he says, is your heart right as my heart is? So there's a little bit of pride that's surfacing here. Interesting, isn't it? Because really, that's the question that Jesus asked Peter. Remember, Peter said, although these disciples uh, might forsake you, Lord, I won't, I'll be there. You know, if I have to give my life up, I'll be there with you. And then, of course, it all went wrong. And then Jesus was resurrected. Remember the walk on the beach with Peter up by the Sea of Galilee? And Jesus asked Peter three questions or three times. He says, is your heart right with me? Didn't he? He said to Peter, do you love me? And they were very probing questions, all about attitude, really. It's not about what's on the outside or sometimes even what we appear to be doing. It's, you know, right on the inside is your heart right. And we ask that question of ourselves, hopefully, every Sunday morning. You know, is our heart right? Have we been faithful? Have we not only eliminated or, or contained things that we shouldn't be doing, but actually have we put into place some generosity or some, put some support of other brothers and sisters in a positive way as far as the truth is concerned. And the other thing I, I think as far as Jehu is concerned, which is a good thing, do we actually seek out appropriate friendships that are helpful for us in the truth? You know, or do, do we just float through life and you know, have a few conversations? Or, or do we seriously try and nurture and develop those friendships that are particularly important uh, when we don't know what to do in a particular situation? So this is the question that Jehu asks of Jonadab. 
come and see my zeal. Now, a little colouring in exercise, which is really good, because this is where we see Jehu's attitude and his heart was really not quite right because you see this word my and me, it's all about him. So definitely worthwhile colouring in all these little personal pronouns here because immediately this opens up and as he reaches down for Jonadab, he says, is your heart right with my heart? Look at what I'm doing. It's all about me, my chariot, where I'm going. So you can already see in the narrative here that there's a little bit of self-presumption as far as his direction is concerned. Come and see my zeal. And of course, that's a, a question that we need to ask ourselves. And certainly, here's a couple of good cross-references to go in the margin there. And one, of course, is about the Apostle Paul, or Saul, as we do know. He was on a similar course. Remember, there's almost a parallel in the New Testament. The man Saul, you know, Pharisee of the Pharisee, what was he doing? He was going around exterminating the early Christians because he thought that was the right thing to do. And so he writes about his heart, his attitude, his life a little bit later on in Philippians. He says, concerning zeal, you know, now he's embarrassed because he said, I was persecuting the ecclesia and touching the righteousness, which is the law. I thought I was blameless. Well, he got it all wrong and Paul acknowledges that. And again, uh, as far as the Jewish people are concerned, in Romans 10 verse 2, he says, I bear them record that they've got a zeal for God, but it's not according to, to knowledge. So, you know, the, this whole culture, as far as Israel is concerned, they've got their festivals that they still keep, uh, but it, it's, it's not appropriate, it's not according to a proper understanding and acceptance of the God of Israel. And the, the Jewish people are very much secular people, and a lot of their rituals are just that, they're rituals, and they, they don't mean much else. But here's a couple of quotations as well on the positive side, as far as zeal, because... You know, we need to say, is zeal a good thing? Maybe, you know, was Jehu right in ha having this energy and this zeal? Well, yes, he was. So here it says in John chapter 2 and verse 17, his disciples remembered, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. Now, Jesus Christ was energetic and enthusiasm. He had a zeal and a love for God's house. So it's not as though we should put that aside and say, well, you know, I need to be a nebulous person. Um, you know, a little bit of apathy doesn't go astray, a little bit of monotony. No, we don't want that at all. We want to actually flip to the other side. We still want to be zealous, but in a, in a right way. Uh, Galatians 4 and verse 18 said, It's good to be zealously affected, uh, always in a good thing, not only when I'm present with you. So he's writing to the Ecclesia in Galatia. And he says, I don't want to just see you enthusiastic when you've got a special weekend or a special effort on or a camp. You need to be consistent in your zeal and your love of God. Titus 2 verse 14. Uh, Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a special people, zealous of good works. And that's ourselves. And again, he repeats this. Our Lord Jesus Christ says in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love are rebuke and chase and so be zealous. So, you know, we can't look at Jehu and say, well, he was just a bit over the top. He needed to calm down a bit. No, he needed not to calm down. He needed to just direct it in the right manner. And for ourselves, of course, let's not discard this aspect of zealousness and enthusiasm. Now, you know, do people see our zeal for God? Because that's the question that Jehu said uh, to Jonadab. Look at me, look at what I'm, I'm doing. Um, is it seen in positive and negative ways in our lives? And again, living the truth doesn't have to be a showy display, does it? It can be a quiet, consistent, faithful activity. Brother John Sebazic, who's fallen asleep, over the last week or so, is, isn't he a great example of zeal? Like he wasn't out there showy, uh, verbalising everything, but he was there for a quarter of a century almost, down that back corner there, 25 years plus, attending every single meeting, recording, taping, running the microphones for us. What a great service. What an amazing zeal. What a, what a lovely enthusiasm and what consistency. So it doesn't have to be up in a chariot, busy showing to everyone. It can be here with consistent attendance and conversation, a love of God which people will see. Well, in verse 16, <clears throat> Jehu puts his hand down. He, he, he lifts him up into the chariot, into verse 15. And uh, in verse 16, it says, come, come with me and see my zeal for Yahweh. And I also, you know, this little next phrase is sort of interesting in the King James Version. It says, so they made him ride in his chariot as though 
as though he wasn't quite sure whether he wanted to go with Jehu and probably at the end of this journey he would have preferred to stop in his tent because it wasn't probably you know the best Saturday afternoon outing that he'd have in his life but um, it almost seems to be a sense of reluctance in some ways they made him ride in his chariot so this is Jonadab so Jonadab's name or Jehonadab means Yahweh is willing and Rechab, he's the son of Rechab, it means, interesting, to ride. So when you put those two names together, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, it means Yahweh is willing to ride, and I'm going to add, if Jehu's attitude was correct. Now there's an additional play on words in the Hebrew because the word ride, there in verse 16, is also, it's, it's an associated word, it's the word Rechab. It's the root word of um, uh, Rechab's name. And the word chariot there as well <coughs> is the word Rechab. Slightly different Hebrew word, but they're all interconnected. They're almost the same. So there's a complete play on words here. Yahweh is willing to ride, to ride, to ride. And the lesson here is, yes, Yahweh was willing to go to ride, in a sense, with Jehu in his work, if his attitude and his direction was correct. And I think Jonadab was placed there to try and give a correction to Jehu's obsession. Which we notice because Jonadab only appears for a couple of verses here and then again in verse 23 and he disappears from the record uh, and doesn't resurface until we get to Jeremiah chapter 35. So it's almost as though Jehonadab is put in this position to help correct Jehu's obsession. And, you know, brothers and sisters do that in our lives, don't they? Sometimes we get focused or we've got a problem or we've got an issue and we're sort of going down this way and someone, maybe a husband or wife, says to us, hey, just step back a little bit and have a think about the bigger perspective of, of what's going on here. And it's so helpful sometimes to have that information from another person, another third party, someone who's seeing it from a, a different viewpoint to help correct perhaps an obsession that, that we have with a particular aspect of life. So I want you to come across to Jeremiah 35 because I think we're going to learn this very wonderful man, his spiritual maturity, his depth, and the influence that he had on his family. And there's a couple of little colouring and exercises we can do here in Jeremiah 35, some key words that will help open up who was this Jonadab, the son of Rechab. So first of all, just a very simple overview of who he was. So we've got a timeline here. So you might remember right back in the book of Exodus, when Moses, was, uh, Moses went out into the wilderness of Midian, he actually married into this tribe of the Kenites. Um, Jethro was, of course, the father-in-law of Moses. He married Zipporah. Okay, so Zipporah was a daughter of Jethro. Hobab, who's also mentioned, is Moses' brother-in-law. Right, so there's a family line here that's connected to Jethro. Down the line a little bit is Heber, mentioned in Judges. Remember, Heber was not quite as faithful as Jael, his wife, who destroyed Sisera. And coming out of this family line, of course, is Rechab, and here it is, Jehonadab. So that's the family line. So here's just a snapshot. You'll notice back in around about 1,500 years before Christ, this is where we first get introduced to the family line. Uh, they're mentioned in Judges. Here's where we are in 2 Kings, and here's where they're mentioned by Jeremiah. This is 250 years later, so a very, very faithful family. In fact, it even goes beyond that. So here's just a, perhaps a, a, a more detailed snop, snapshot. Uh, here in Exodus, we've already said Moses meets, and he, he's called Ruel, who means a friend of God. He's the priest of Midian. So Moses married into this family. Um, and then, of course, there was some advice given. Jethro gives some advice. Remember, Moses is wearing himself out. Um, he's leading this whole group through the wilderness. There's lots of issues. There's almost like two million people. And Moses is wearing himself out. And Jethro comes and gives him some very wise advice. He says, why don't you appoint 70 elders to, to help you with you know, these particular issues? Uh, Moses asked Hobab, who is his brother-in-law, to travel with him. Look, you know the wilderness, you can navigate for us, you'll be very helpful for us. And in that particular reference there, um, we're not quite sure whether he went because he says, no, I think I've got you know, my own family, I need to tend to my, my, uh, my area of life. 
But there in Judges, we see that he did go and the Kenites were there with, with the tribe of Judah. Again, just I referenced um, Heber, who separated himself, um, but of course, um, Jael, his wife, maintained the family values. She destroyed Sisera in quite a, a, a difficult way. Um, here, Saul advised the Kenites to move. He's going to destroy the Amalekites. So he said, you need to, because you're a, a godly people and you're associated with that, you need to get out the area because I'm going to come through and destroy the Amalekites. Um, here, we've got a list in the chronology that they're included with the tribe of Judah. So the chronicler puts all the tribes of Judah, their families, and he includes, he includes the Kenites. And here's where we are tonight. There's the first mention of Jehonadab or Jonadab. 250 years before Jeremiah 30, so very consistent, very faithful. Uh, and here he is mentioned here. And then in Nehemiah, quite interesting, um, one of the descendants, we've got Malchiah, the son of Rechab, repaired the Dungate, willing to take on the worst. So this is even after they've been sent across to Babylon, and now they return, and the Kenites, the descendants of Jehonadab, the Rechabites, still there with, with the nation of Israel. So quite a remarkable history so this is the um, this is the thing we can we can color in, in in Jeremiah 35 is the word father so this is the first point I just want to pick out so verse 6 7 8 10 and 18 have a reference to Jehonadab our father now the nation of Israel hasn't been faithful as far as their worship is concerned so God said to Jeremiah I want you to uh, visit the Rechabites and placed before them wine and they had a very strict law family law that they were not to take alcohol and even although uh, uh, an outstanding prophet said here's some wine let's you know have a conversation and, and have this wine they said no our father instructed us not to that's that's 250 years before I mean I can't even wind back 250 years to my uh, you know great 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 grandfather so quite an amazing faithfulness and they had a respect for Jehonadab. They call him our father. So it's not as though there's just a, a list of rules and regulations. It's like, well, our father gave this and we understand the reason why. It's living a godly life. So this is the positive aspect of you know, service to God. And the other thing is this word all. So they didn't just take little bits in a way like Jehu and say, well, I'm happy to destroy people and that's, that's my you know, forte in life. <laughs> Um, it's this word all all that he hath charges to drink no wine all our days we've done all that he said we've kept all his precepts and done according to all he has so there's an element of great faithfulness in the descendants of the man who stepped into the chariot with Jehu 250 years later so the point is of course they lived the truth and the Rechabites had a uh, a law or a principle or a value in life that they would abstain from liquor, that they would live a nomadic life in tents, <clears throat> they would avoid city living, and they would depend on God for their sustenance. So they separated in some senses from the people of Israel because they wanted to maintain their faithfulness. So this is the lesson to Jehu, is that they were living the truth in a positive way, not just going around destroying others, they, they integrated in some sense in the people of Israel and they lived it in a positive way as a demonstration of their, their love for God. So the other aspect which is important as well is this little um, phrase, we've done it, we've performed it. So you see, the truth wasn't just a matter of theory for them, they were actually doing it. And again, this is a point for Jehu. You know, it's not just going around executing people, it's actually living and doing the truth. And so this phrase, again, comes out in verse 10, 14, 16 and 18. We've done it, we're doing it, we're living the truth. So they, uh, they treated Jonadab and their forefathers with great respect. They were faithful to all the commands that were given and they lived those commands. It wasn't just lip service for them. So again, you know, there's exhortations that filter down to us you know, it's not just a matter of us taking the or reading about the values of the word of God. We actually got to live them and do them and be them. And that was the house of the Rechabites, a very, very faithful house. In fact, what's sort of interesting 
is the way that they're described there in Jeremiah 35. It's always the house or the family of the Rechabites. So it wasn't about individuality. When Jehu came, it was all about him as an individual. That's about it. But the house of Rehab or Rechabites were, were a family. And so we've got this phrase constantly, the house of the Rechabites. They bring them into the house of Yahweh. They, they were connected. House of the Rechabites, again. But when you come over here to Second Kings that we've been looking at tonight, it's the house of Baal. All right, so there's a, there's a great sort of contrast and a difference there. So we're coming back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 10 just to pick up, and that was just sort of a little divergence to, to show the character and really the purpose of Johanadab and you know, what could have been a, a very interesting and helpful conversation to realign Jehu into a proper course in life. Well, what happens? Well, we come back, uh, of course, and in verse 18... We read this uh, next little scenario that um, he gathered all the people together, 2 Kings 10, verse 18, and he says, Well, Ahab served Baal a little, gee, who's going to serve him much? So there's, there's some treachery and intrigue going on here. He particularly wanted to destroy this temple because this temple was actually built by Ahab for Jezebel. 1 Kings 16, verse 32 says, Ahab reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. So in some senses, when anyone looked at this particular temple, uh, that was a representation of really of Ahab and Jezebel and their religion. So Jehu wanted to remove any any evidence of of their existence, I guess, and their worship. So again, we're going to come to this little scenario where there was no opportunity given for people to repent. And this is where I think Jehu went far beyond his responsibility of just removing the dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel. Now he's spreading it out in a very destructive manner. So we notice uh, an interesting little phrase in verse 19. It says there, Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. All the prophets and priests of Baal, I thought they would have disappeared because if you knew Jehu was thundering around on his chariot, you know, exterminating everything that he saw. If I was a prophet of Baal, I'd be hightailing it right out of the, you know, right out of the nation into some little hidey hole in, you know, the Bahamas. <laughs> well, maybe that's a bit exaggeration, but, um, you know, you, you, you wouldn't want to hang around Samaria if you were a prophet of, of Baal. You know, you'd think they'd disappear, fled from the violence of Jehu. But here they are, they all emerge. And in fact, the temple's just absolutely packed, full of people full of worshippers and, and priests and, and prophets of Baal. This is, this is quite strange, isn't it? Well, it's not strange because the parallel is sin itself, isn't it? These people, of course, the, the, the worshippers of Baal, a representation of sin itself. It just doesn't go away. never seems to disappear. Jehu might have gone through and sort of exterminated some of it, but they've all just, they've all just popped back up again. And isn't that like sin in our own lives? You know, we, th- we think we've got a little victory and we sort of rejoice and celebrate that and before we know it, we're, we're back into the same rut trying to dig ourselves out. You know, the Apostle Paul found that. He found that sin just kept reappearing, just like the prophets of Baal. Romans 7, verse 15 to 25, I won't go there, but he says, you know, I, I struggle with sin. It's a war that's going on. I find I'm not, I'm not winning and I find it frustra- frustrating. I think I have a victory and then... You know, I get distracted and it's just so annoying. How am I going to get victory? Only through Jesus Christ. So Paul, you know, describes in a similar way these prophets of Baal, or sin as it were, just popping up. And don't we find that, brothers and sisters? You know, on a Sunday morning we come in, we're quite confident. We commit to a new life, the week that's going to be ahead of us. We're going to serve God faithfully. Uh, And then by, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday, the old ways have kept back in. And by Friday and Saturday... uh, we're back to our normal old self. <laughs> and it's like a bit of a cycle, isn't it? So for, for the people of Israel, uh, unfortunately, these prophets of Baal were still there. Well, Jehu says in verse 19, he then goes on, he says, look, gather, gather them all together. In the middle of verse 19, I've got a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Well, I think there's a bit of irony or a bit of sarcasm here because there was going to be, as far as his plans were concerned, there was going to be a big sacrifice. There was going to be a lot of people were going to be killed. 
But I think the record says um, he did this subtly. Verse 19, just about three quarters of the way through. He did this subtly. I think that's a bit soft. You know, the King James is a little bit soft, really. Um, it's the only occurrence of the Hebrew word okhba, and our lexographers tell us it's the root word for the word Jacob, or the name of Jacob, who was the heel catcher. Remember, that's what his name means. Remember, he's always battling out with Esau, and, and he lived a life of intrigue and deception. This is that same word here, that word um, subtlety. It's connected to the root word of Jacob. It means to be treacherous, to be deceitful, to be dishonest. And that's exactly where Jehu was going down that pathway. He wasn't emulating the integrity and justice of God. He's now going down a pathway of dishonesty. Because as the king, he could have destroyed the idols and commanded people everywhere to repent, to think about their ways and to change their lives. He didn't give them that opportunity. He just slaughtered them all. So he was more focused on a massacre of people and destruction than he was on building and rejuvenating people up in the right way of worship. And of course, um, we need to be people that are prepared to allow new opportunities, well, for ourselves and for other people as well, to rebuild their lives. Well, the thing that's um, particularly interesting when we come to verse, um, verse tw 21, the end of verse 21, so this invitation goes out, for a solemn assembly. Verse 21, he sent it through all Israel, uh, and here they all are, the worshippers of Baal, in verse 21. And the end of verse 21 is interesting. It says, the house of Baal was full from one end to another. Uh, might be an illusion, perhaps. Remember, there was a house that was full of people that were destroyed back in the times of Samson? Judges 16:27. It says the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women. So back in the times of Samson, Judges 16, 27, a parallel situation almost. And remember Samson pushed on the pillars and, and the whole lot destroyed uh, these, again, worshippers of Baal. But this particular word, and if you look in your margin, you'll have the Hebrew um, means mouth to mouth. So... The idea is that it's full to the brim. The Gesenia says from one corner to another, uh, and the idea of a cup that's full up to the brim from, you know, you can put your mouth on one side and it's full or around the other, it's full up. So the house was packed, packed full. And the same Hebrew word is used, 2 Kings 21.16, in the word, it's the word filled. It says there, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he filled Jerusalem from one end to another. So if you know a little bit about Manasseh, very brutal king, similar attitude initially to Jehu, who just slaughtered the prophets of God, and the narrative says he just spread that blood all through the streets of Jerusalem. Field is the word. So this is the word uh, here. So, you know, here's the question. Why isn't our hall filled tonight? You know, here are people that are enthusiastic about their worship of Baal, and they've packed their hall full of people because the invitation has gone out. And we do have to think about, well, you know, the zeal of Jehu is, is certainly an important part of our own lives. You know, what, why isn't this hall packed full tonight? I mean, we drive past mega churches with, you know, people, thousands of people in attendance with you know, a whole variety of different things that they're doing and people are passionate and enthusiastic. You know, are we? I mean, I'm preaching to the converted here because you guys are here, so, <laughs> you know, wasted breath really. But it's a sort of a, a thought process, isn't it? Are we th really enthusiastic or zealous to get together, to have fraternal time together, to study the word together, to worship God together? These are just integral parts of what a passionate person does. Of course, we live individually in our lives, but what a privilege and honour to get together and worship God and study God together. It's really important. And of course, we've got to think about future generations. You know, as the seats get emptier and emptier and the hall gets less and less, you know, and I know we're not going to go for another 250 years, but I'm just paralleling with Jehonadab and his generations went for 250 years of faithfulness. Would that happen here? So, you know, it's a question we need to ask and we need to have an input positive way as well. Anyway, the house was full to the brim. And so the command goes out in verse 22. He said unto him that was over the vestry, bring forth the vestments. 
Well, you know, what's a vestry? Because I guess we don't use that word often. So it's just a store chamber where obviously many of the religious items and the robes were kept. Now, we don't use the word vestibule. I think Sister Kerry does, but we normally say foyer. But there's this word vestibule, which I think has overtones to a church. Uh, so I don't, you know, prefer not to use it. But uh, it's, it's related, of course, and this word vestments is, is related to all the ornate garments and the distinctive sacred robes. So here it is here, of course, and um, these worshippers of Baal had distinctive robes that they would put on. So here they are. Here, this is the Russian Orthodox Church. This is their robes. And you'll see the little, that's, that's the Russian um, identification there on their particular robe. So this is you know, how they dress for a particular process of worship. What's really interesting about this is there's a bit of contrast between the robes that the priests of Israel wore. So here is this um, word again in Zephaniah 1 and verse 8. It says, It will come to pass in the day of Yahweh's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all who are clothed with strange apparel or vestments. So this is this same word here, okay? So they're bringing out these vestments, this strange apparel. What's interesting is when we wind back up a couple of verses from Zephaniah, chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, I will stretch out my hand upon Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the Cameroons. Cameroons? What's all that about? Well, interesting, because here it's the Hebrew word, Kamar, Kamar <coughs> it's the root word, from a Hebrew word meaning black. So they're black garments uh, which they wore or the marks which they branded on their foreheads. Adam Clark, who's a commentator, um, says, why should we imitate in our sacerdotal dress these priests of Baal? It's strange to think hard in itself. So what he's saying <coughs> in modern worship, why do our priests walk around in black you know, robes? Because that's a connection back to the Cameron who were uh, the worshippers of Baal and not faithful people. And then, of course, we've got a little comment related to the black frocked priests in contradistinction to the white gowned Levites and priests of Israel. One symbolised sin, the other symbolised righteousness. So these vestments were got out and, of course, uh, they put on all these um, robes and they were going to worship their god Baal. Now, interesting little point in verse 23... And there's a contrast here. <clears throat> Gee, who gives the command? Well, make, let's make sure there's no servants of Yahweh amongst them. We don't want to get a mixed up. It's all about separation because, well, he had a plan, of course. So he wanted to make sure there were no servants of Yahweh. Now, I just think it's interesting. I'm just going to draw the contrast between beginning of verse 23 or halfway through. It says the worshippers of Baal, but at the end of verse 23, it doesn't say worshippers of Yahweh. It says servants of Yahweh. Okay, so there's a bit of a difference there. They're the worshippers of Baal, they've come in to worship a false god, but the people of Yahweh are described not as worshippers, but as servants. All right, so there's a servant aspect to the worship of God. Well, of course, it's quite violent. We, we notice in verse 24 that Jehu has 80 men now with him. So he's, he's, he's not on his own, he's not just riding around in a chariot on his own. He's now got 80 men, which is quite a bit, and um, quite a considerable force because he's going to advise these men they've got to go in and slaughter. You can imagine just how bloodthirsty and how terrible this whole process is. So in verse 25, um, it came to pass as soon as he's made an end of offering the burnt offering that Jehu said to the guard and the captain. Now that word guard, the Hebrew word is runners. Okay, so it's given to the bodyguard of the king normally who ran alongside the chariot or ran alongside. And the same word is used, we won't go here, 1 Samuel 22, verse 17. It's where Saul said to, to his men, to his guard, turn and slay the priests. And if we went back there, you'll notice in the margin it has runners. Okay, so this was the, generally the bodyguard that would run alongside the, the king or the authority to protect him. And Jehu had 80 of these, they're runners, and of course, well, they're going to do more than running, they're going to run in and, of course, slay the people, which quite horrible and the record at the end of verse 25 says when you run in kill them with the edge of the sword and 
the, rec- the narrative says, and the guard and the captains cast them out. So, you know, it's quite graphic. They're just slaughtering people there and the bodies are getting thrown out of the temple. So this is just quite violent. And again, at the end of verse 25, it's got, and they went to the city of the house of Baal. Well, it's not so much the city. I think the ESV has the inner room, or what we might say, the Holy of Holies. So they penetrated all the way through and cleaned that whole place out with slaughter. So this is where Jehu really went quite wrong. And I've tried to emphasise and underline tonight that he did not give people the opportunity for repentance. That's the important criteria. Jehu was just obsessed with killing people that had any connection to Baal. So this is where he went uh, particularly wrong. And we'll consider in our next session, of course, the, the end of the chapter where there's a bit of a summary of his life and we'll, we'll cross over to the Hosea. But the, the end of the story, which, again, is quite graphic and and fairly negative, is verse 27. It says, They break down the image of Baal and the house of Baal, and they made it a draft house unto this day. They made it a sewer. So they just destroyed it. Not only did he destroy it, he completely desecrated it. One commentator says this, To say he made it a refuge dump is literal, uh, and he made it into a public toilet. And then he says, A place for human excrement, so the, all, the virgin, all the versions understand it. Nothing could be more degrading than this. So, you know, this is the end of the study. It finishes on a, you know, focus on the toilet, which is really, really bad. But, you know, that's how the breakup works. Um, so, yeah, he destroyed the, the temple and just turned it into a public toilet. Just really horrible. Um, but very interestingly, they found a toilet 2,500 years old, which is pretty interesting. Not here, of course, up in Samaria. It's actually down in Lakish. So in 2016, here's the toilet here. <laughs> Doesn't look that comfortable, eh? <laughs> 2016, archaeologists working at uh, Lakish made a, well, I don't know about amazing, made a discovery. They found a toilet in an ancient Baal shrine. Site is dated around the time of Hezekiah. They did some tests on it. I hate to think what the tests were like. Uh, but they said it was never used. It was only a symbolic gesture. Though this is not the toilet Jehu, I don't know why they got news there. <laughs> I might have to grammatically change this. <laughs> he ruled uh, 130 years before Hezekiah. It showed that turning Baal temples into outhouses is one way Israel commonly desecrated pagan temples. In contrast to Hezekiah, the Bible suggests the Israelis regularly used the Baal temple as an outhouse for years in Jehu's day. So, you know, what, a, what an amazing and quite a negative end, really, to this whole little story. Rather than offer people an opportunity for salvation and, and renewal and rebuilding, he ended up just destroying them, desecrating it, and turning it into a public toilet. So you can see where you know, a slight divergence ends up you know, in this particular position here. So what, uh, what lessons have we learnt tonight? Well, I think four lessons, three or four lessons. Jehu prided himself in his fastidious zeal for destruction. However, do we show any zeal in a positive and active way for the things of God? So let's not look at Jehu's life and just say, well, you know, he was just overly zealous. He needed to calm down a bit. Uh, We still need to have a passion and a love and an energy and enthusiasm for the things of God. Let's not let that drift. Jehu found, and we made the point, he actually met, he connected, he knew this man, Jehu found and had a connection with Jonadab, a faithful family man. Do we seek out friendship and appreciate advice from those well-grounded in faithful service? It's really, really important to get good perspectives in life. So often we go off on a little tangent because we, we, we miss focus, we've got tunnel vision. And we need that broadness, which is great in ecclesial life. We've got a lot of different brothers and sisters we can get advice, weigh it up and be discerning. The Rechabites lived the truth for hundreds of years. Are we confident that our successive generations will hold the truth? You know, as parents, as grandparents, are we living a good life that will will, uh, distill into our grandchildren or to the young people, if we've got families here, to the new generation, the young ones? Uh, That's important. The Baal worshippers, remember, they filled the house from brim to brim. They were excited about their worship practices. What passionate input do we have and how do we feel about worship, study 
and involvement when attendance is declining? Do we really have an input? Are we really concerned? Are we enthusiastic? Do we want to get together? I mean, COVID, I know COVID hasn't been done with because all the new stats are coming out today about you know, this third wave that's going through, but we sort of had a bit of a break during COVID. You know, have we regenerated ourselves in the joy and the privilege of fellowship? Well, they're the lessons of Jehu, uh, the determination that he had, let's think about his life but let's make our direction a positive one as far as our service to God is concerned. going to have perhaps um, a summary tonight of what we've learned about Jehu and I hope by the time we finish tonight you'll be a, a little bit more like myself my own mindset I've actually shifted what I thought about Jehu initially probably from some Sunday school lessons where we briefly considered his life uh, we thought well Jehu was just a bloodthirsty man he came and he killed people and that was the end of his life but he's actually more deeper than that and he does actually have a genuine love and regard for the things of God. We, I think we've seen that over our previous studies and we'll see that a little bit more tonight. There's a couple of verses that are quite outstanding as far as Jehu is concerned. Great commendation from God. So in our, just to, to recap and to rebuild a little bit, uh, you remember we first started off with the selection of Jehu. He was across in Ramoth Gilead. He was a general in the army and he was selected by Elisha he was anointed by one of the sons of the prophets and immediately he discarded his life in the military service as it were and of course he began the commission that Elisha charged him with and that was to remove all the uh, household, the dynasty of Ahab and the worshippers of Baal. And we saw the seriousness with which he conducted that. He went, he took out two kings, he took out a queen within a very short period of time and of course it rolled on from there. He had a, a strategy in place where the 70 descendants of the house of Ahab were then destroyed. He also removed some of the people, the elders uh, of the city of Naboth, Jezreel. He took them out of the way as well. That was, that was justice. And then in our study before we had our break, we had a look at this principle of separation where he destroyed really all the worshippers of Baal. He got them all in the temple and he eradicated the whole lot of them. Quite an amazing instance as far as Jehu was concerned. Well, tonight... We take a little bit of a different direction because we're now going to have a look at the whole summary in some senses of his life and what God thought about it. So uh, is it a disappointment? I think it'll be an encouragement for us because I think we need the exhortation, uh, as did Jehu, that we may have begun well, but how are we doing now? You know, we may have been in the truth for a number of years. Maybe our energy is flagging. Uh, and if so, then maybe we're following the footsteps of Jehu, who began very well, but then spiralled down. So our theme for tonight is shortfall. We're going to have a look at this end section of chapter 10 and our, our key verse, of course, is verse 31 there where it says that Jehu uh, took no heed to continue to walk in the ways of Yahweh. And that really was the summary. So we'll begin at verse 28. And this is where we're up to as far as the accomplishments of Jehu. Verse 28 is quite a commendation. It's thus Jehu destroyed Baal from out of Israel. Now that's quite significant. This was a foreign worship introduced by Ahab or particularly Queen Jezebel. It infiltrated uh, right into the northern tribes there that become a way of worship for them. Jezebel was very fastidious with, with promoting this. She was uh, going to exterminate, of course, Elijah because he stood for the things of God. So she was a very formidable queen, pushed all this worship into Israel. Well, of course, Jehu was strong enough to push back on everything that Jezebel did. And he had no qualms to remove her uh, from being queen as well. So there's a commendation that Jehu destroyed the worship of Baal out of Israel. Then again, uh, layer on top of that verse 30, because this is uh, a verse I want to unpack uh, a little bit because it really does give a balance to who Je Jehu was. Verse 30 says, And Yahweh said unto Jehu, uh, this isn't anyone's just sort of uh, comment about an observation, it's actually God's commendation of what Jehu had accomplished. And he says, Because you have done that which is well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, 
You've done to the house of Ahab according to all that is in my heart. Now, that, that's, a, that's a very big commendation. Clearly, there was considerable good in the actions of Jehu. Maybe before we began this study, like me, I thought, well, you know, Jehu is really just a bloodthirsty man, didn't really accomplish anything. But we're now coming to God's summary of where he was at this particular point. And God is saying, I appreciated, Jehu, your sincerity, your honesty of heart. You fulfilled the commission that I gave to you. You executed judgment against the house of Ahab and you've driven out the worship of Baal. And for this, he was going to be rewarded. Of course, at the end of verse 30, he says, because of that, God says, I'm going to reward you. Another four generations of your family will sit on the throne. So it's not as though God looked at what Jehu was doing and said, well, you know, you've gone a bit overboard. So as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of the matter. No, not at all. God commends Jehu and he adds in some sense as a reward saying, well, your dynasty will continue for another four generations. And in fact, he says, you've done well in verse 30. You've done well. The Hebrew word there is exactly the same word that's used of David's desire to build the temple. Um, Second Chronicles 6 and verse 8 says, Yahweh said unto David, my father, for as much as it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you've done well that it was in your heart. So this is the same Hebrew word that was used for David, his desire to build the temple. That same Hebrew word in which God uh, commended David is the same Hebrew phrase here used for Jehu. So, you know, their sincerity was commendable as far as God was concerned. And you'll notice particularly in this, in, in this verse, there's, there's a couple of little uh, wonderful commendations. So when we look at the verse, here's the two important phrase. You've done what is right in mine eyes. So there's no question. This is, this is God's stamp of approval of what Jehu did. We might look and think, well, he was a terribly bloodthirsty man. And, and that was what was required to eradicate the worship of Baal. And you've done as the house of Ahab according to all that was in well, God uses the term, all that was in my heart. So his family was rewarded with an unbroken four generations, which was almost 50% of the length of the kings that ruled in the northern kingdom. So when we look at all the kings in the northern kingdom, Jehu's dynasty took up almost half that genealogy. And even when we wind back and think about, well, David, did David have a long dynasty? Well, you know what? His own son divided the, ki the kingdom, the north and south, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So David, in some sense, didn't have a united kingdom that four, of, four generations of his son ruled over. It, it just broke open um, at, at the, um, the grandson of David. So, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to draw a comparison and say, well, gee, who was more wonderful than David, but I'm just you know, balancing this out, that he had great commendation. And what's interesting is there are similar correct connections to some great uh, kings in Israel who had that commendation, but also, more importantly, some great characters as well. So, for example, in Joshua 14, verse 7, uh, 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of Yahweh, sent me, me from Kadesh Barnea to spite the land. So this is Caleb. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. So here's a man who had great intentions and he carried out what God required of him. So I'm lining up Jehu with some great characters. Again, David, 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, Yahweh sought a man after his own heart. Well, that's exactly the same phrase that is used here in the commendation of Jehu. Um, again, here uh, in 2 Chronicles 31, this is Hezekiah. In every work he began in the service of the house of God and in the law, in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. It's Hezekiah. And here, of course, we have Jeremiah, who's a great prophet. He said, look, I don't want to talk the things of God. I don't have the capability. I don't have the qualities. I don't want to be a prophet. But he said, God's word was in my heart like a burning fire and I couldn't stop from, from being a prophet. You see, they're all great men. And Jehu is on a similar parallel. In fact... We might even say he received a greater commendation because none of them receives God commendation in this phraseology. This is all their, their own narrative in some sense. Uh, you know, Caleb here is talking about what was in his own heart. This was not God's summary of his life, although we know he lived a very godly life. So all I'm showing here is, 
you know, we might have to recalibrate a little bit about how we think Jehu. Was he just a bloodthirsty man? Well, here's some very significant commendation from God that parallels with some of the great characters of the Old Testament. However, <laughs> always a caveat, uh, you know, there's a small print. However, of course, I did skip over a verse or two. So you'll notice in verse 29 there's this word, how be it. And in fact, you'll remember there are a number of phrases that Jehu fulfilled. It said, according to the word of Elijah, that said back in verse 17 of this chapter. So that's where that basically almost draws a line. Jehu accomplished what Elijah, Elisha, uh, and Elijah, of course, commissioned. Originally, Elijah was commissioned to anoint Jehu, which was fulfilled through Elisha. Um, in verse 17, that's basically the last time that phrase is used. So we don't hear that phrase used against, again. So in building a correct perspective, what we're achieving is that he accomplished the commission with his whole heart, sincerely and honestly, with what God had asked him to do. He did that well, says God. But from here on, um, all that bloodshed was pointless. It was a downward spiral now because he didn't change the heart of the nation, which was really what God wanted. And I have to thank Brother Ross. A couple of weeks ago, Ross, when I was talking to him, he, got, he sort of mentioned a quotation. Which I thought, that's a really good quotation. It's from James. There's this quotation here. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And I think that really is a great crystallisation in some senses of what Jehu is all about. Not that he was an angry man, but he was certainly quite, quite violent, quite bloodthirsty. He executed a lot of people and got them out of the way. But he didn't follow up, he didn't layer it with the development of righteousness. He didn't encourage the people in faithful and true worship. He didn't eradicate, sadly, uh, the golden cast, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, you know, our life in the truth has to be that perfect balance. It has to be the right balance. It has to be to exterminate or control the things that we know don't please God. But we can't stop at that point. We need to build an extra layer in which we are devoting, in which we are improving and developing our characters and our personalities so they're more like God's. So that's where Jehu, of course, came a little bit unstuck. And you'll remember in our previous study when he invited Jonadab up into the chariot with him, he said to Jonadab, come and see my zeal for God. And, of course, that was... Uh, I think that's quite a... a a prideful comment really Jonadab was a righteous man and in the background of that what God is telling us is it is possible to live in an ungodly environment and still retain our own righteousness Jonadab was like that he didn't have to be a he didn't have to be a Jehu and go around killing people he just lived a godly life in a very godless society very similar to what our lives are today so you know, this word in verse 29, I've got circled and I've got it connected with verse 31, but Jehu. All right, so there's two verses here, how be it, and then again in verse 31, but Jehu took no heed, which gives us the full perspective of the life of Jehu, the very significant words. So what started out as a divine commission became a human omission, we might say. He had the pathway, he had the direction, God commended him for what the pathway that he took, you know, but, but the journey didn't stop there. He needed to continue that on and develop uh, in the nation a people who were worshipping faithfully. So he removed the foreign worship that Ahab and Jezebel had introduced. That was the worship of Baal, but he allowed Jeroboam's long-standing worship of the golden calves at Dan and Bethel to continue. And in some ways it's sad because Jehu had a lot of great potential, didn't he? When we look at those early characteristics that he had, enthusiasm, energy, focus, dedication, they're great qualities to have. You know, may, maybe we don't feel that we have those qualities. We look at other people and you know, we see their enthusiasm, we see their focus or their consistency in life and they go, I wish I could be like that. But Jehu was a man who had all the potential to change the, the, the northern kingdoms. And that was really what God wanted. God didn't want just to exterminate Jezebel and 
the other kings and that was the end of the story, that, that would be just a partial fulfilment. God wanted to move the nation so they became faithful worshippers. And so really it all fell apart from here. There was no re, real rebuilding or renewing of the nation. So well, you'll notice there that at the end of verse 30, well, verse, end of verse 29, it says, He departed not, um, that is, the worship of the golden calves that were in, Dethel, uh, in Bethel and in Dan. Oh, I had another overhead, of course, up here, which I meant to add the balance to, uh, and that was to append this quotation here, which Paul talks about in Galatians 5. Yes, we do have to have self-control. We do have to remove those distractions. But on the other side, we do have to develop the positive elements, the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul lists them, you know, love, joy, peace, patience. So it's not just telling people what they need to do. You know, you've got to pull yourself together or this is the wrong direction going. We've actually got to build people up and encourage them as well. That's where Jehu fell apart. He was OK at pointing at everyone and saying, this is wrong. But we've also got to show an example to other people and say, well, this is how we do it. This is the right thing. So that's the balance. But back at the, uh, the golden calves at Dan and Bethel, right. So back in 2011, we had the fortune to go to Israel. And this is the thing that staggered me. The size of the altar that Jeroboam originally established at Dan and Bethel. We're in Tel Dan here in Israel. Look how big that altar is. You know, most of us probably imagine it was like a, you know, an altar maybe about that big with a little maybe golden calf standing beside or something. But when you go there, it's absolutely massive. So this is what Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, this is what he established up there in Dan and in Bethel. And you can see Andrew and Olin, there's a few others there as well. You might recognise, I mean, it's quite a substantial altar. And that's our guide there, Jeff Abel, just sort of talking about uh, the history and the archaeology of that particular area. So what Jehu did was he removed that foreign introductory worship of Baal, but he didn't take out the golden calves that were established by um, Jeroboam. Now, in our own lives, of course, we tend to look at that picture and say, well, you know, that, that's really terrible worship. Fancy having an altar there fancy being idolatrous but what we don't realize is what altars have we built in our own lives you know are there are there massive altars in our own lives that we're actually worshiping that we're spending most of our time uh, focusing on rather than the things of God I mean this is so important to us you know to come here on a, on a Wednesday night and to to open God's word and to correct that balance because maybe there's some big altars in our lives that are gone undetected We've allowed to remain there. So this is the, the whole point about idolatry. Are we affected by idolatry? We probably say, well, no, we're not, you know, because that's all Old Testament stuff. That happened thousands of years ago. We don't have altars now. But metaphorically, maybe there are things that we give more attention to or give more weight to than the things of God. So this writer here, of course, talks about what idolatry is all about. Uh, and he talks about professed reverence for the God of the Bible and idolatry are still perfectly compatible. We just think because we've got a Bible and we're here that, well, we're not idolaters. But uh, he goes on to talk about, and he says, um, we should observe that back in the original time, in the times of Aaron, when the golden calf was put in play, it wasn't particularly set up as a rival to God but under the pretense of being a helper, stepping stone to his service. Aaron built that golden calf and said, oh, you know, this, this, these are the gods, these are the Elohim that brought you out of Egypt. So it was like a, a helpful stepping stone because they couldn't see God, so, well, here's a golden calf. It's a representation of God. We can't think that there are two sorts of idolatry, the person who bows down to an image of wood, metal or stone, and the spiritual idolatry of the person who loves husband, wife, child or money or other aspects in 2022, you know, technology, Facebook, entertainment, more than God, they are one and the same thing. So that's what we've got to realise. You know, we look at Jehu and say, oh, you should, should have cut that out and, you know, got rid of all that worship, but, you know, what about our own lives? And so therefore it comes into the New Testament as well. And the Apostle Paul, very interestingly, in four quotations in the New Testament, 
redefines idolatry as not just bowing down to something made of metal or wood or stone, but he talks about all of these aspects of life which sometimes we get involved in, and he says that's a definition of what idolatry is all about. So these are very important exhortations for ourselves. The reason why we study the Word of God is not just to, well, look at the life of Jehu and say, well, you know, he got it all wrong. Fortunately, I'm here on a Wednesday night and I've got my Bible open. Well, not at all. We've sort of got to dig around a little bit more and say, well, are there things in our lives that are distracting us from faithful service and developing the positive uh, quotes and attributes uh, that exist in the Bible? So, of course, what Jehu did was he allowed the golden calf worship at Dan and at Bethel to continue. So he didn't remove that. Now, what, what's all that about? What does that mean? Well, you know why they were put there? So the people up in the north didn't have to travel down to Jerusalem. So it was a worship of convenience. Essentially what Jeroboam put in place is he didn't want people going down to the southern tribes of Judah. He didn't want people going down to Jerusalem. He wanted to keep people up. And so he put calves at Dan in the north and at Bethel in the south of the northern kingdom. So it was a worship of convenience. You know, you don't have to go down to Jerusalem. You don't have to travel the way. Uh, you can just sort of worship here locally. And I wonder if we've had sort of overtones right through COVID season and now we're emerging that we've had that sort of effect that, well, you know, you don't have to go to the meeting. You can just flick on the, uh, the, the live stream. Hello there, everyone, the live stream. <laughs> you can just flick on the live stream. You don't have to, you know, pack the car and get your Bibles in the car and all the kids and, you know, go to the hall and come all the way back. So maybe there's been a little bit of infiltration. We might even say laziness, maybe. Um, as far as we're, we're concerned, has our worship become um, a mindset of convenience? Because that's the problem. And that's what is being underlined here in the, in the narrative. So I think really this whole section, this summary of the life of Jehu, really has a powerful exhortation for ourselves. It has implications for our own spiritual pathway. Where are we on that particular pathway? You know, we might have begun well, and I'm sure we all did. I'm sure we all remember that moment we came out of the wars of baptism and we thought Christ's return was only a couple of years away and we thought, I'm going to live a faithful life because it's only going to be two years. And then five years goes by and 10 and 20, 30, 40, <laughs> 50 years go by and have we still got that same enthusiasm, that determination? Are we in a positive way growing spiritually? Because that's the whole point of the the summary of Jehu's life. He didn't. He got to one great point and then just sort of really just relaxed. And so the whole point of the judgment seat is not how well we began, it's what have we become. Isn't that the question the Lord Jesus Christ is going to ask us at the judgment seat? What have you become? Did you support your brothers and sisters in a practical way? What were the characteristics and attributes that, that you inculcated into your life? So that's the question that he, he will ask us. So I think one of the lessons really of uh, this, this section where Jehu didn't get rid of the convenient worship, really it comes down to us in 2022. And the question is, are you 100% committed to continuing to grow? This is the thing. You know, after baptism, we go on a steep curve, we're learning, we're accumulating everything, and then we, do we plateau? And maybe we even sort of slide down a little bit? So this is the question. No good looking at Jehu's life and saying, well, you know, he began well, but hmm, pretty sad that he didn't continue it. What about, what about our own lives? What about me? What about you? Because we're living really on the edge of the return of Christ and we want to be prepared in a very positive way. So one of the lessons I, I felt coming out of this contemplation of Jehu is this particular point here. It's easier to vehemently judge others, and we do that, we look at everybody else and we point a finger and we see their faults and they're so blatant and so obvious and we think, why don't they, they deal with those faults? Than to be vehement about doing good in your own life. We don't apply the same rule to ourselves, do we? We don't think, well, I, I, I really need to improve myself. 
I, I need some positive growth. How am I going to get that? I need to grow spiritually. I plateau. Often we don't uh, apply that to ourselves, and we need to, and we, we should. Uh, Titus, Paul writing to Titus, says, speak evil of no one. I mean, how hard... I mean, when we're talking about Jehu and we're, we're talking about his ability to see people who were worshipping faithlessly and identified them and exterminated them, sometimes we can be a little bit like that, speak evil of no one. Well, that's pretty hard to do because we have conversations about what we think about other people. <laughs> and avoid quarrelling, be gentle uh, and show perfect courtesy toward all people. So that's growth, that's, that's development, that's who we need to become. So God, as, we, as we've been seeing from this particular passage, has been pleased with the initial outcome. He's commended Jehu. He said, what was in my heart was in your heart, and you followed that faithfully. But nothing positive occurred from then on. And this was very early in the reign of Jehu. He reigned for 28 years. If you have a look at chapter 12 and verse 1, you'll notice there in the narrative it says, in the seventh year of Jehu. So we're right early in the, in the reign of Jehu. It's not as though he, he sort of was a very slow downward spiral. He basically appeared on the scene. He did what God commanded, but there was no resurgence through the nation. And we'll notice when we come to verse 31, uh, it says, But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of Yah, God of Israel, with all his heart. So I've got that little phrase coloured in, all his heart, in verse 31. And I've got the phrase in verse 30 coloured in, all that was in my heart. And you see the disparity there? He started off well. He really aligned his heart with God heart, God's heart. He did what God wanted, but then it fell apart. And so in one verse we've got commendation. In verse 31, a sense of sadness, I think, as far as God was concerned, because Jehu lost his momentum. So... You know, th this is who Jehu was, and we're very much like him. You know, it says that uh, he, didn't, he didn't follow God, verse 31, with all his heart, because the next sentence says, he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Well, you know what? He wasn't much different than all the kings, in some senses, because here in 2 Chronicles 15, verse 17, the same comment is made about King Asa, who was a good king down in Judah. But the high places weren't taken out of Israel, but the heart of Asa was perfect. So, you know, in some ways, Asa didn't remove the false worship either. Here is Amaziah, 2 Chronicles 25, verse 2. And he, Amaziah, did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh, but, well, he didn't have a perfect heart either. And then we come to uh, 2 Chronicles 32. Hezekiah rendered not again the benefit done to him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was God's anger upon him. Oh, that's Hezekiah, great king, an amazing king. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is Jehoshaphat, which again was a good king down in the south. He walked in the way of Asa, his father, he departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of God, but, well, you know what, the high places weren't taken away. So here I've got this note, they all had good motives, but they weren't consistent. So, you know, was Jehu really that much different than a lot of these other kings? They wanted to serve God faithfully, but there wasn't the, the consistency. And so we have to be very careful, of course, as far as Jehu is concerned, because in some senses he wasn't a lot different than many of the other kings who served God in a faithful way, but they didn't eradicate or remove the false worship either in Israel or in Judah. And so we'll notice then there's a comment in verse 32 that there were troublous times ahead as far as Jehu was concerned. Verse 32 says, in, the day, in those days Yahweh began to cut Israel short and Hazael, he's the king in Syria, smote them. And then it lists in verse 33 from Jordan, this is east of the Jordan, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, the Reubenites, the Manassites from, the, uh, from Arna, which is by the river Arnon, even Gilead and Bashan. So the whole land east of the Jordan collapsed and was invaded by Assyria because Jehu wasn't going to maintain his faithfulness. And you know what? He was a faithful general. You know where we first met Jehu, our first introductory studies? 
He was at Ramoth Gilead. He was on the east of the Jordan in that particular city. So geographically, here's our map from when we first started our studies. Remember, this is where he got his commission. This is where uh, Elisha sent the son of the prophet up to Ramoth in Gilead. This is this whole section here. Well, the narrative is now telling us that all this territory here, all the way down, you won't probably see that, but that's the river Arnon there, all this territory here was taken by Syria. So, Jehu was a, a military genius who defended that area of territory. Now that was all being removed. Uh, the tribes of Gad, Reuben and Manasseh had been invaded by the Syrians. It was all being reversed. How particularly sad is that? You know, what he defended at one stage, he was leaving undone. I wonder, when we wind back to our baptism and our commitment and the values and principles that we had and we said, oh, I won't give up on these, I wonder if we've allowed them to be invaded. I wonder if we've allowed them to be overrun by the enemy. Because, you know, back 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we had a clear pathway. Now, perhaps as we get a bit older, it becomes a little bit blurry. It's become a little bit harder. So, again, very sad for Jehu. He defended that territory at one stage, now totally taken over by the enemy. Well, verse uh, 36 says the time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. It's a long reign. It's actually the second longest reign in the northern tribes, apart from his great-grandson Jeroboam II, who reigned a little bit longer. So it wasn't as though, again, just trying to get the balance right, it wasn't as though God said, Jehu, you've done right, but now you're doing wrong. I'm going to take you off the throne. Done. No, Jehu continued for, for 28 years. So quite an extensive reign but notably he lost the energy that he had initially. He had the momentum. Remember, it's just quite incredible when we read those, those early chapters, chapter 9, chapter 10, he just appears in scripture, he just wipes out the enemy very, very quickly. You would imagine that with that momentum, he could have uh, transferred the, um, his energy, his enthusiasm down into the nation and restore again the faithful worship to God. But that was not to, to be. And again, you know, we need to think about our own lives. Well, that's not the last reference, interestingly, to Jehu. There's one we're going to go to, uh, and it's a reference that's troubled me for some time, particularly when I began these studies. I, I looked at it and thought, that doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, there seems to be some discrepancy. So the reference is in Hosea. So we're going to come now to Hosea. It was an end prophet just across to Hosea, and we're just going to unpack this and hopefully... Uh, there'll be an answer to, well, what may have troubled you, but it certainly troubled me, looking at the character and personality of Jehu. So it's in Hosea, uh, chapter 1 and verse 4. This is the last reference to King Jehu. Hosea 1 and verse 4. Verse 3, Hosea was a prophet. Um, he, he was commanded by God to marry a prostitute and in verse 3 it says so he went and took Gomer the daughter of Diblaim which conceived and bare him a son and then in verse 4 Yahweh said unto him call his name Jezreel for yet a little while and I will uh, avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel now when you read that verse it sounds, that word avenge, it sounds like, well, God was horrified at what Jehu did and he's going to avenge on the house of Jehu and the kingdom of Israel. That's how you read it, right? I'll avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. Now, that doesn't make any sense because what we've pre prefaced our talk with is that he had the commendation of God for that, for that particular action. God said, your heart is like my heart. I commend you, Jehu, for what you've done. You've exterminated, of course, the dynasty of Ahab, and that's exactly what I wanted. The worshippers of Baal, you've taken them out. Good work. And then you read this verse and you think, wait a minute, does, is God saying he's, that Jehu went too far and he's going to avenge the blood of um, Jehu? So what, what does this all mean? It doesn't make any sense if God um, commended him. And here, the actual uh, condemnation was the nation's adherence to the uh, 
false worship that was there in the northern kingdom. So Hosea prophesied he's at the end of the northern kingdom. They're going to be taken into captivity very shortly. Jezreel here means to scatter. And so what God is saying is, I'm going to scatter Israel because of their faithlessness. Because of Israel's faithlessness, God's going to scatter them. And the blood of Jezreel was not because of the execution of Joram or Jezebel. As we said, that's the command of God. So the house of Jehu is the descendants of Jehu. Uh, the four kings that followed that didn't really capitalise on introducing true godly worship. That didn't happen. So I'm going to give you the answer in a second, but I just want to preface it with this, that all the sons of Jehu continued to really allow the worship of the golden calves, which was the thing that detest, was detested by God. So you notice here's the four kings, 2 Kings 13. Here's his son, um, Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, just simply says he did that which is evil in the sight of Yahweh and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. The calves, he didn't take them away. And the son of Jehu didn't take them away. And the grandson didn't take away. Here's Jehoash. Again, same phrase, he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam. It's, it's like a rubber stamp going through. Second of Kings 14, here we've got Jeroboam the second. And exactly the same phrase. And again, by the time we get to Zechariah, who is the fourth, the great grandson, great, great grandson of Jehu, uh, he exactly did the same. So you've got all the dynasty of Jehu and they followed exactly the same pattern. They allowed this false worship to continue. So again, how are we going to make sense of this text? Because, you know, in our consideration, this word avenge doesn't seem right. Well, the key is really in the Hebrew word itself, which has, I think, been sadly mistranslated in the King James Version. Um, so it's the, key, the word padak, and it means to visit, to reckon, or to pass in review. So God is passing in review the people of Israel, their false worship, and he says the violence that was taken out by Jehu, you're going to get that from the Assyrians. So all the blood that you saw shed by Jehu, I'm now going to bring that through the Assyrians onto the northern tribe. So it wasn't that he's condemning Jehu. He's actually condemning the nation of Israel and saying, you saw how that Jehu exter exterminated everything that was wrong? I'm going to bring that same violence now into the northern tribes and remove you all. I'm going to scatter you all. That's that word Jezreel. So here's the key. Here's where that word is translated again. King Jerome went out to Samaria and numbered. I'm going to number Israel in a sense because they're faithless. And I'm going to bring again the bloodshed of Jehu through the, through the Assyrians. Here it's word the visit. I'm going to visit Israel again. Um, they sacrifice flesh uh, and they eat it, but Yahweh accepteth them not. Now he will remember their, their iniquity and visit their sins. It's that word visit. It's not the word avenge at all. And here's I've got just a little section here. It should be translated... And I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu and cause the kingdom of Israel to cease. So you'll notice that in the very next verse. It uh, goes on in verse 5. It says, And it will come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So I've got the interlinear there so you can see that how they've translated it. They've got here, I'll visit the blood of Jezreel. That same violence that Jehu used to execute upon faithless worship, I'm going to parallel that in how I deal with the northern tribes. You're going to be taken away into captivity. So that's the meaning. So God's going to bring that same level of violence uh, that befell Ahab's family now across the northern tribes. One translation says, uh, and I'll bring the bloodshed of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu and cause the king of Israel to cease, which they've got there. So this wasn't a punishment by Hosea for Jehu's zeal at Jezreel. Rather, it's that his descendants and all those northern tribes haven't learned the lesson. So God's going to, in fury, allow the Assyrians to invade and that would be a discipline for the nation. Again, a paraphrase would be, just as Jehu brought violent, brutal bloodshed on Jezreel, his descendants haven't learned the same lesson 
so I'll bring it on them and on Israel. Okay, so in my Bible, uh, I've crossed out the word avenge, just to make it a bit more clearer for myself, uh, and I've just got the, the, the Hebrew word there, and it means, you know, to number or to visit. So that's what that prophecy is saying. It's not condemning Jehu because it wouldn't make any sense when God's commended him. Rather, it's saying the violence that Jehu used against the dynasty of faithless worshippers, that same violence will now be meted out by the Assyrians because I'm so disgusted with Israel's behaviour. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. And that's really uh, the last reference to, to Jehu himself. So... This, I think, in the end, is, is sort of the, the summary of our whole contemplation of Jehu and his life. It's, you know, how do we begin? How are we doing? Where do we think it'll all end as far as our own lives are concerned? We've got to be able to import what are the practical outcomes for us as far as the life of Jehu is concerned. I think it's contained really in this particular phrase. In the end, it doesn't matter how we begin. You know, we all began hopefully at a good starting point with our baptism, our enthusiasm, our energy. It doesn't matter what we've performed on the way or what's dis distracted us. What counts in the finish is that we must be drawing close to the heart of God in our full devotion to him. That's a great lesson. It's a great lesson for me because, you know, I'm 40, 50 years in the truth. So I know what it means to plateau. And I look back on my earlier life and think, wow, I had a lot of enthusiasm, I had a lot of dedication as a young person, but do I still have that? And it's a bit of a prod to think, well, I looked at, you know, we look at Jehu and, and he didn't sustain himself and we need to really, coming out again, COVID, where we've had sort of a, a relaxation, really, it's been a bit of a challenge to all of us, we nearly, we really need to take it up a notch. And that's, again, what Peter says in his epistle. He says we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So it's no good for us following the pathway of Jehu. Good start, great start, and then just plateauing along and thinking, well, you know, it's taken a bit longer than I thought for Jesus to return. So, you know, for us being here, it is important for us to be at the study class, to open our Bibles, to talk about uh, the things that really interest us. That's growing, and we've got to continue to do that. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns, he's got to follow the same pathway as Jehu. He's not going to return Jesus meek and mild. I'm going to give you some quotations to talk about what Jesus is going to do when he returns and he's going to execute justice upon this earth. Isaiah 63 verse 3 and 4 says, oh, I'm going to tread people in my anger and trample them in my fury. There's going to be blood sprinkled on my garments. I'm going to stain my raiment for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed is come. So he's coming back to judge the earth. Second of Thessalonians, New Testament, chapter 1, verse 7 and 9 says, Our Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Revelation, going right to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 19, verse 15 says, Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. He's going to strike down the nations. He's going to rule with the rod of iron. And he's going to tread them like grapes because of the fury and the wrath of God Almighty. You know, it sounds quite horrific, doesn't it, really? But our world is getting to the state of being in such a mess that somebody's got to sort it out. And it's not going to get sorted out by, you know, we need to do something about climate change by 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It needs someone with discipline. But that's not all our Lord Jesus Christ is going to do. He's not just coming back to destroy people. He's coming back to build the kingdom. You see, in our Lord's character, there's this beautiful positive edge. And he's coming back to change and rejuvenate the world. That's the perfect balance. Isaiah 2 says people will go up and they'll say, he's going to teach us of his ways and we want to walk in his paths. See, it's not all just destruction. There'll be discipline, sure. But overlaying all of that will be, of course, the teaching and the education of our Lord Jesus Christ in positive aspects. Isaiah 56 and verse 7 says, I'm going to bring people to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifice will be accepted and my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. 
So it's not just death and destruction. There's a beautiful overlay of what our Lord Jesus Christ is going to accomplish. He's going to educate. He's going to teach people in his principles and values. He's going to build a house of prayer. Of course, we can put on the top of that Psalm 72, a whole chapter on all the wonderful change that Christ will bring to the poor, to the needy. So that's, that, that is the perfect balance, really, and that's what we're looking for. So as far as G, he was concerned, we say he's a successful failure, but what of the story of our lives? Wouldn't it be sad to have that comment made to us? You began okay, but you know what? You just plateaued off. So what are the takeaways uh, for ourselves when we think about the life of Jehu and this, particularly this, this last snapshot? A divine calling doesn't guarantee a life pleasing to God. Remember, Jehu was anointed by Elisha, one of the sons of the prophets. And that was a great commission. You know, we might have the sort of feeling that, you know, God has held out his hand to us and he's given us an invitation to be his kingdom. And so therefore, you know, well, you know, it's pretty well guaranteed. I mean, God obviously thinks something of me to do that. But it is no guarantee. So we have to think carefully about our lives and particularly on the backdrop of Jehu. Do we pride ourselves, as Jehu did, come and see my zeal, in actively removing worldly attractions, we can do that, that's okay. But what about, but actually we're failing to be positively involved in fellowship study, fellowship worship and fellowship support. This is, you know, the integration of a community as an ecclesia, as a family. This is where we build the positive aspect of our lives by holding out our hands to other brothers and sisters and young people, helping them on the way in a, in a, in a positive environment. So we need to be here. And this is great that together we can open the Bible and we can grow in our knowledge. This is, this is a, a great and a positive outcome. Thirdly, are we content with halfway obedience? You know, are we a bit more relaxed or a bit more casual? Or are we 100% committed to continuous spiritual growth? And if we say yes to that, how is that being demonstrated in our lives? How, how is that being seen in our lives? And finally... Don't become a successful failure. Create a vibrant spiritual life and draw God into your life every day. These are the great lessons. Jehu's been a great study for me. I've loved it. It's helped me to balance his character. But more importantly than that, it's helped me to apply some of the exhortations and some of the challenges that were seen in the life of Jehu to my own life. And hopefully with ourselves, when we do meet our Lord Jesus Christ, we won't be successful failures but will be successful examples of developing characters and personalities like our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.